Welcome to the conversation. I'm Heil Russell. And once again, I am Gibbon. And what are you drinking? You better be drinking this time, <laughs> Gibbon, because I, I listened when I was editing the last episode. I listened back to me and I sounded like a sloppy ass drunk throughout it <laughs> while you had clear, concise enunciation and it made me sick. So what are you drinking on part two for Conquer's Bad Fur Day? I am drinking a wonderful can of Quilter's Irish Death, left over from St. Patrick's Day. Uh, well, in, in the St. Patrick's Day spirit, and I do associate Conker's Bad Fur Day with St. Patrick's <laughs> Day, considering it, 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 they're both, uh, of March, you know, and there's not Get too many back things. back here, you ginger bastard. There's not too many things in March, uh, that are heavily associated with drinking, so they kind of become linked in my head. Yep, I am just drinking... St. Patrick's Day and my birthday. Well, oh, happy birthday. That's right. I, I keep forgetting <laughs> to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I have a Geddes, uh, which is now vegan, mm. uh, because they, they removed the f- fish bladder from the, the process of making it, which seems like wow. a totally unnecessary way to make beer. Uh, so Listen, I, I'm, it's Irish. <laughs> well, I, I am enjoying this, this new vegan Guinness where no, um, uh, no fish were harmed in, in the production mm. of it, which makes me, makes me feel good. Um, what makes Unlike me feel... some of the levels we'll be talking about today. Right. Yes. The fish will get harmed quite a bit in this one. Uh, what makes me feel bad though, is a mistake I made. Mm. on the last episode that i need to correct and i already announced this on social media how wrong i was and quite frankly i'm i'm ashamed with myself because i shouldn't be making these these bush league level mistakes in my Mm. antidotes about the history of the donkey kong universe so on the last episode i discussed that when rare was presenting bad fur day originally to uh, nintendo uh, because even though Rare published it, obviously Nintendo had a stake in Rare back in the day. Nint- you know, it, it, it's still a Nintendo exclusive game. So, you know, they're like, hey, we, we've got this idea in mind for Conquer. And so I said that when uh, the, the bit that we'll be discussing on this episode where, where Conquer inexplicably unzipped his pants that he does not wear and, and started urinating on the fire imps. I said that uh, Nintendo president at the time, Hiroshi Yamuchi, w- just cracked up at, in uproarious laughter. When in fact, uh, I, I got that antidote wrong. It was actually Nintendo of America founder, uh, Minoru Arakawa, who, who loved the, the squirrel piss. And, Quite honestly, I, I take this stuff very seriously, Gibbon. And the fact that I attributed the 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 love of woodland rodent urine to the wrong individual, it it, it just devastated me. And I, I haven't I, been able to eat. I haven't been mm, able to sleep. And so I would. You've been like, able to drink, obviously. Well, that's uh, the only what, thing that's been getting me through. <laughs> yes, but um, I think what what happened was so in the antidote in the story that mm-hmm. I absorbed it uh, because Nintendo of America president at the time Howard Lincoln was also there, and so the word president mm-hmm. got lodged in my brain. And additionally, I, uh, Mr. Yamauchi is given the final special thanks credit in the Bad yeah. Friday credits, so his name may have stuck in your mind. Yes, yeah, somewhere somewhere along the way, I just held up Mr. Yamauchi as uh, the, this this piss loving dude, and you know, I think that really like colored my impression of him for so many years now because <laughs> I I was just like. I, I felt like I had a relationship with the man. I understood him. And now 
he's a stranger to me overnight. Mm-hmm. I don't. And so I would like to apologize to his family and to his legacy. And I would like to apologize to Mr. Arakawa as well, Nintendo of America founder, uh, who is actually uh, the the guy with the, 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 the wicked sense of humor when it comes to uh, piss and video games. So apologies all around. I will strive to do better in my uh, PP-based Donkey Kong journalism. <laughs> so... <laughs> And we'll try not to make any mistakes on this episode that will necessitate corrections on the next. Although, I'm sure that will happen around Matt's Tower. So, because that is the that is a portion of the game <laughs> that I cannot commit to memory. And I feel as though you have said the same. Uh, yeah. Even playing through it, I was like... Wait, did this section exist? What? <laughs> it's like a section. Well, we'll get into it. I, I, I'm yeah, yeah. bearing the lead here. So, Conquer's Bad Fur Day Part 2. Now, we're going to be discussing chapter to chapter the game a- a- as as it is. But Conquer's Bad Fur Day is a... It, it's an odd game to try to discuss in <laughs> such form. Because the structure itself is very loose uh, you you can tell Chris Seaver and Robin Beanland wrote the dialogue sort of in an improv style. They just went along and and wrote everything. Yeah, there's there's a famous anecdote about uh, the film Milo and Otis, which originally was a Japanese film that had like um, haiku and poems being read over these woodland adventures of this kitten and this puppy. Um, but for the American version, they got the uh, the voiceover artist in didn't tell him they were recording and just kept pouring him scotch. Yeah. As he made up stuff for like the initial pass. And I kind of feel that's sort of what happened here. <laughs> uh, it, I think it's exactly what happened here. And th- so like uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day is often described, you know, it, it's, it's a 3d platformer, but it's not a 3d platformer in the same vein as Banjo-Kazooie or Donkey Kong 64, to carve out its own identity when it made the leap from 12 Tales to Bad Fur Day, and to set it apart from the Banjo series, I think, in particular, because you know, Rare had three 3D platformer series like in the oven throughout the mid to late 90s into the early yeah. aughts. And, yeah. you know, I think Seaver, when he took over the project... Um, and it kind of became his baby. He really like, okay, we need to set it apart from Banjo. We, and, you know, aside from finding that the hook, the angle where they were going to make an M rated, uh, lewd and crude game, they, they also decided like it was going to be more of an experience rather than a crisp platformer. If, if that makes any sense, it, it was, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the Oddworld series as well. I just Mm. don't talk about it a whole lot. But they are classified as cinematic platformers where they're more about the experience than the platforming mechanics. And they have these sort of contextual actions and stuff that go along with them. Sure. And I feel like Bad Fur Day is much more that type of game than it is something like Super Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie. It it really did find its own identity, and that's why even though, you know, when people compare Conquer with, with Banjo, I, you know, I don't think it's a fair comparison because they're not trying mm-hmm. to do the same thing. So obviously, if you're just comparing them on pure nitty-gritty platforming, Banjo will always win. But Conquer <laughs> really went for that cinematic experience. But I bring that up because the way the plot is structured... It is so loose and freestyle. It almost feels like a past yeah. a story. It, it doesn't feel like... It, it just feels like Seaver and Beanland were having a laugh. And it, in some ways, it works as a parody of convoluted video game stories. <laughs> and in other ways, it doesn't work at all, but it somehow still hangs together. Yeah, like there's there's parts of it that are kind of like... Yeah, this is a world where stuff goes on without Conker's knowledge, and some of it, he's never ha- going to have knowledge of it. He just kind of wandered into the middle of it and wandered out, and he doesn't really know what was going on there, and that makes it feel 
much more like a living, breathing world. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, there's stuff where it's just like you, the player, are like, what, what the heck was that about? What's going on? What did I just participate in? Yeah, and it, it, it's it's awkward too, as you know, we're both Americans, um, and this is the most British game that Rare released on the N sixty four. When I say like humor wise <laughs> references, it's yeah. it's a lot. I I think Seaver just in general, like when you look at his output. Uh, as kind of an auteur game developer designer, he 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 does he has like areas of interest that appeal to him, and I think he never tries to. And I I say this as a plus, like I'm this isn't me knocking him. I I don't think he ever tries to sort of water it down for like an American audience. Like you, f- I really mm, feel like yeah. Rare really strived during this time, and this was probably direction from Nintendo as well, but they were like, you know, let's Americanize our output a little bit, even down to the spelling, you know, like they used American mm. English uh, for those Donkey Kong games and Banjo-Kazooie, and, you know, you don't see that anymore in, in Sea of Thieves or over at Platonic with the Ukulele series. You, 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 They're definitely British. They're definitely mm-hmm. loud and proud products of the UK. But... um Conquer, I think, is the only one on the N64 that really embraced that. But that meant a lot of the jokes and references flew over our American heads at the time. And yeah. so you got that. You get like a lot of what I consider or have a feeling are just in jokes between Seaver and Beanland. <laughs> and because, you know, they're, they're close friends. They're, they're really, yeah, uh, in, yeah. in real life, like besides Beanland doing the music for this game. You know, they're I they're like best buddies. They watch each other's dogs. They when I went to Rare uh, in twenty fifteen, I I've never met Chris Seaver in person, but I had the great pleasure of meeting Robin Beanland a few times, and I mm. uh, of course uh, spent some time with him uh, at Rare when in twenty sixteen, uh, and I actually got to ride in his car uh, oh, while man. he was driving because um, like. Everybody on the trip went went out to dinner uh, to I think like the one Italian restaurant in Twycross. Uh, and I'm so jealous. It, it, I mean, it was a surreal experience. But yeah, I got to ride uh, in the in the front seat of Robin Beeland's car, and he had to apologize for the dog hair in it that was actually Chris Seaver's dog. Uh, so <laughs> I but that, that that that's my one Kevin Bacon esque. Uh, like tie to Chris Seaver is that I sat in his dog's hair once. <laughs> <laughs> that seems eminently apropos. So you get a lot of like, I think in jokes between them in this game, you also get the parodies, uh, mostly movie parodies. Yeah. And you know, Conquer's bad fur day. It, it kind of came out right around the time of, the scary movie franchise and but it predates the really hacky ones that came out later in the aughts like Mm -hmm, yeah superhero movie and date just blank movie basically oh god i forgot those existed and you know this this is kind of like this awkward period in pop culture where YouTube isn't really this entertainment juggernaut that it is today where people just pull up YouTube for a night's entertainment. And so, and, and, you know, nowadays we communicate, uh, references like this through GIFs or GIFs, if you will, on Twitter. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just like, oh, here's this, here's this, uh, animated, little silent image of this movie or TV show. And we're going to use this meme to communicate whatever. And that's how Mm -hmm. things are referenced nowadays. So you have no need for this like parody genre. Uh, So, you know, Summit Conquers Bad Fur Day, the humor probably doesn't hold up. And I say, you know, humor is subjective. So I'm not going to like make a definitive statement on that but i you know it, it depends what the reference is i feel like yeah. Conquer's bad fur day really soars in the parody department yeah it's when, it's interesting when, to see how conquer went about it versus how like gex went about it because it was also mm-hmm. doing that same sort of thing 
I, I feel like Conquer soars in the parody department when it takes something as a starting point, but then really goes off in its own direction. I feel like mm. it falters when it's basically a shot for shot remake of something just with squirrels and, and whatnot <laughs> in its place. Uh, because I, I, I like when Conquer takes a kernel of an idea and reappropriates it for Conquer's world. Mm, um, yeah. An example of that is. Heinrich, who is a xenomorph alien from the Alien franchise, but he's not an alien in the context of Conquer. He's this genetic experiment. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's it's a little bit dodgy, you know, like like a lot of the lore in Conquer. But it, mm-hmm. it's, you know, th- I think that works, whereas the Matrix parody doesn't because for one thing, the Matrix has been parodied to death, and it's not even that amusing anymore. Uh, and sure, back in 2001, seeing a parody of, like, this really, like, iconic moment from a relatively recent movie in a video game starring a squirrel, it was pretty cool and novel. It was it just, really it, cool. It just didn't age all that well when everyone else did a Matrix parody <laughs> in the in the following years. Uh, but, you know, like, the uh, the parodies to me, like... They're, they're just there. Like, it, it works in this odd sort of tapestry that Conquer is. This improv goofing off between two friends, essentially. Mm, uh, and, you yeah. know, like, because Beanland, you know, I think Beanland doesn't get enough credit for his contributions to the story because it, it, it was yeah. him and Seaver. And so, yeah, but the, the, the story, there, there is a story. Beyond just the set pieces, <laughs> but really it is a day in the life of Conquer and the residents of the Panther Kingdom, this corner of Willow Woods that is the Panther Kingdom, however you want yeah. to parse out the geography here. But it is uh, it is a ridiculous plot, and when I say it seems like it's a parody of convoluted video game stories or stupid video game stories... <laughs> and it, it just leans into being stupid for uh, like for stupidity's sake. I mean it. So I did not transcribe any of the plot. I did not write any of it out in the show notes. I thought it would be amusing for us to try to describe it without <laughs> notes. Uh, yeah. Like how high high concept level are we getting here? Because at a very very high concept level. It's it's Conquer doing a bit of a walk of shame the morning after. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so basically, there there are two or three plots that are inter- intertwined, and they all come together. That's at true. The end. Yeah, yeah. There's there's Conquer basically waking up in a field or or a garden, um, yeah, completely like hungover and feeling sick after a night of debaucherous drinking. There, there is this uh, plot. Then it ties into that his relationship with Barry, who you know was in Pocket Tales, was intended to be the co-star of this game. Still, is billed mm-hmm. as the co-star in yeah. the game's opening, but has a very minor role. Uh, but basically, Barry is pissed at Conquer and takes it out on him in a ludicrous way very passive aggressive way well becoming a, a gangster's mall like <laughs> i i i like out of all the ways you could get back at your boyfriend for uh going out drinking and, and not not phoning be- becoming he joining the mafia is uh is is pretty much up there in extreme takes but uh th- there's that and then the overarching plot, like, while all of this is happening, there's palace intrigue afoot between yeah. the Nazi weasel scientist who may, in fact, be the displaced king uh, from hundreds of years ago and the current king of the Panther Kingdom, in fact, the Panther King, and the attempts at uh, of this mad scientist slash displaced king the the mythology is a bit dodgy here but yeah, basically it's... he he's trying to 
overthrow the king by starting a war with his own uh, fascist teddy bear yeah, army. Yeah, he's got a couple different <laughs> plots running at the same time in the background. And, oh man, you you talk about the mythology being dodgy. I've got the, the manual here next to me. Yeah. And it's like, it starts out with a little, ex, like an expanded version of the scene with Conker in the pub at the beginning. But then it gets into like extra information you might need to know and it's just like two or three pages long of like oh and here's this stuff about like the ongoing war and this information about like the ancient milk wars the milk wars here's yes. here's the the legend of the beast of Pooh mountain and yeah yeah it it, it is this- it is a dense mythology that even Chris Seaver couldn't keep straight by the time he got the live and reloaded. <laughs> but, like you don't, you don't really need any of this background information because they kind of cover the the salient points in the game itself. So the, but the at only the same thing time, that I think you really need background on is the milk wars because the milk wars yeah. and milk in general, it, it's a weird angle. Uh, basically, though. Conker gets into the crosshairs of this palace intrigue while he's just trying to get home, nursing his hangover, because the Panther King was drinking milk, and he set it on his table, and it turns out the table only has three legs. The milk spills, and and literally this all gets rolling because of spilt milk. And the Professor decides to explain to the Panther King that he can fix his table problem, uh, not by, like, getting a new, like, just, like, getting a new table. He can fix the the table he set his uh, spilt milk on by getting a red squirrel to act as the fourth leg on his table. I just want to point out, look at that table. There's no way this was an accident. That was a clean cut. Oh, yeah. The z- the z- the professor had yes. to set this up beforehand. Yeah, yeah. This like, but literally, this is the dumbest fucking plot in the Donkey Kong universe. <laughs> it really and, fucking is. And then, no, that's this is why I adore it. Uh, when I say it's the dumbest fucking plot, I mean that highest compliment. But oh yeah, very everything. Endearingly. Everything else is, is even like the really. Like the plots that almost seem like parodies of video game plots, like K. Roll steals Donkey Kong's bananas. Donkey Kong is sad, or the really weird convoluted plots, like K. Roll is no longer the acting Kremlin King, but he has a puppet monarch in place that's actually a killer robot named Chaos, and he is using Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong's brain waves to power the robot. Uh, that was only two years after the banana thing, by the way. I, Donkey Kong got uh, weird when you, fast. When you spell it out like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, you know Banjo-Tooie had a, had a slightly more convoluted plot than Banjo-Kazooie's thing. But this is, this is a convoluted plot that is purposely bad. It, it, it's the, the Panther King is sending out his forces to abduct Conquer. So Conker can serve out the rest of his days or to be murdered and taxidermied. There's a couple of different game over sequences which actually show this uh yeah. like, show this play out. They're, they're just like Banjo and Donkey Kong 64, you see this alternate like the Hero Falls timeline in the game over sequence where <laughs> where Conker is in fact captured and becomes this table leg but this is literally why conquer is now being targeted throughout the course of the day because the panther king has got it in his head and the panther king well we'll get into the characters here because i don't I, yeah. I have some thoughts on the panther king and the professor obviously and conquer and barry and yeah and else. it's it's that's one of the reasons i i actually really like young conquer is because it kind of recontextualizes a lot of this stuff um, every Conquer game some, after, like, oh, huh, moments to it, yeah. Every Conquer game after Bad Fur Day has recontextualized this story. Mm, <laughs> so, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, Live and Reloaded definitely mucked up the mythology here 
quite a eh. bit. Like, you really okay. need to... yes, yes, it did. But then again, Young Conquer uh, went with like the original version, so you just kind of have to assume like the professor had some prosthetic legs for a hot minute or something. Um, I would never dare to use prosthetics in my fan wanking, good sir. You're right. You'd be completely serious about it. <laughs> so, uh, basically, prosthetic golfing though, legs. Come on. Basically, though, th- this palace intrigue between the Panther King and the Professor, it-, it all stems from this centuries ago conflict. And, and how long ago it was is-, is a bit dodgy itself. Uh, it-, it-, it can be anywhere in like the 16 to 1700s or it can be even further back, depending on what in-game evidence you, you want to source. But it's the Ooh, milk I wars. actually I actually plotted this all out on a timeline. Oh, so. okay. Well, the the Milk Wars uh, was this this conflict, uh, this this ancient conflict, or not maybe not so ancient, at least centuries old conflict in what is now the Panther King, which is this this kingdom within the Willow Woods region, establishing Conqueror's Pocket Tales. Uh, but it it was uh, between. So, oh God, my brain. The, you, there was a weasel king. In? There was a weasel king. <laughs> no, let me see if I got this because I said we wouldn't use okay. notes. So okay. This is this is where I stumble here. <laughs> there was a weasel king, right? And yes. then there was this battle between the squirrels. Uh, the, this this race or or guild of squirrels called the Kulas of Conk. Um, yes. And they allied with the Panthers against the Weasel King and the Teddies, his army of Teddies. Although I think it was just implied that the Teddies were a part of it. No, they were. They were definitely a part. It wasn't yes. just implied. It was established. So that the Teddies were the the Weasel King's forces. And and the two sides went to war. This is where uh, Batula... Uh, he served in the Milk Wars, uh, mm-hmm. which the Milk Wars then kind of become uh, a parallel, in, at least from Bachelor's take, uh, with with the Crusades. And yes. So um. when when Seaver was planning to do his, his multiplayer opus to follow up Live and Reloaded, Conquer Getting Medieval. Uh, I, 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 it's never been, I think, a hundred percent confirmed, but I assume that was going to be the Milk Wars. Yeah, that's, that's what the assumption was. Um, Bachelor's, uh, slash Conkula's birth date is given on a headstone in the game as 1776. So... Yeah, thereabouts, which broadly gels with the uh the date given as something like 300 years ago for the legendary milk wars i did a video biography of bachula slash concula for halloween a couple of years ago so check that out on the dk vine channel i try to make sense of bachula's backstory uh like using uh all, all of the like amalgamations of Vlad Tepish, Vlad the Impaler, with uh, Bram Stoker's Count Dracula over the years. And Oh, uh, man. Do you know what? You want to know something cool I discovered the other day while while uh, commenting on my playthrough? Uh, there is, in fact, a uh, species of squirrel with big fangs and floofy ears called the Vampire Squirrel, colloquially. And Whoa. they are bright red <laughs> and larger than normal squirrels. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to assume they did not know that while making Yeah, I'm going to assume that's a happy coincidence. <laughs> I think they just wanted to do uh, a Resident Evil style room. And they decided they also want to do a parody of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the, the Francis Ford Coppola mm-hmm. movie. And... Uh, they just went from there, but, um, yep, yep. the milk wars are just, yeah, it, it is nonsense and it is it's just super nonsense, heavily textured backstory, uh, that, that sets up 
conquers Bad Fur Day. So you've got all of this going on in the background. But for the most part, the plot of Bad Fur Day is just a day in the life of a squirrel after, like, a very a bad day. I mean, that that's all it is. And it is, like, the one time we have this DKU game that makes no bones about the time frame it takes place in. Because, you know, all these adventures that the Kongs or Banjo and Kazooie go on, you know, they, they could take place over a day, many days, a week, mm-hmm. a month. You know, however long that it might take you, the player, to finish their their adventure. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day has a very clear beginning and end. It, it takes place over, uh, like, a maybe 20 to 24-hour period, and yeah there's there's multiple parts throughout the course of the game where conquer like pulls out his pocket watch for comedic f- effect but like i noticed that the watch actually advances over the course of the game it's not just a static image so you can get a clear look at what time it is in each of those cutscenes when he yeah. pulls the clock out <laughs> yeah and it's... yeah and of like on, on over the course of this episode, we will be discussing the daytime portions, which actually take place more than half of of the game itself. Um, more more than half, where it's um, up through the sunset, essentially. Uh, I mean, I, I guess Uga Booga sort of takes place while the sun is setting. It's got that very like prehistoric aesthetic where. You know, that, that rare, mm-hmm. heavily played with in Diddy Kong Racing, where you've always got this blazing sun for some reason going down. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th- this is actually more than h- half, but I feel like, at least in my mind, and you might differ here, like, the game really takes a tonal shift once the sun sets. And, oh, and a so- very tonal shift. Not just a tonal shift, I'd argue a genre shift. Yeah. Yeah, and I pref- like full disclosure. I much prefer the night portions of the game. A spooky and its <laughs> war. I think I hold up as what conquer really should that's be. What, I I mean that's what everyone remembers about Bad Fur Day anyway. Really? Because I think I would say more more people remember the daytime portions. No, uh, they remember the Great Mighty Pooh and then the nighttime levels of the game. <laughs> <laughs> now they might remember like uh, a lot of Ooga Booga. They might remember barn the Barn Boys, the Big Breasted Sunflower. I mean, okay, they remember one little five second bit from each chapter on the first half of the game, and then the nighttime level. <laughs> yeah, that's assuming they actually got to the nighttime levels. But they uh, probably remember fair. the multiplayer, which heavily drew from the nighttime levels. So. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, I guess, four main characters, uh, minus the, I guess they're, Don Weezo might be, a a main character, but we'll talk about him. Cause he, he doesn't really p- play into the plot un- until Ooga Booga, really. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's talk about Conquer Barry, the Professor, and the Panther King. Uh, because they really get the, the plot moving at the beginning of the game. Now, Conquer, mm-hmm. I don't even know if there's much we need to say that we didn't say on the last episode. Conquer, of course, debuted in Diddy Kong Racing, got his own game with Conquer's Pocket Tales. This is actually his third appearance, but this, this is, this is forever the game he will be identified with, identified by, uh, defined by, and, I mean, I mean, this is it. This is like the the worst day of his life, and the yeah. day his life will be defined by for the rest of his days. Every every release he's featured in since then has been derivative of this game. In <laughs> to and various I mean, for, good, for good reason. You're not gonna. I would like some more Pocket Tales references when Conquer appears. You know, like I I I wish they wouldn't shy away from the totality of his history. Yeah, I would understand it. Which is if- one of the reasons I'm I'm sad uh Project Spark didn't get to continue because in the concept art for stuff for Conquer there were Pocket Tales and Diddy Kong Racing references. Yeah, and we were definitely pushing Team Dakota uh <laughs> to incorporate some Pocket Tales references. Alas, it was not meant to be, but I really feel like we could have gotten an acorn person in there. <laughs> mm. So <laughs> But you know, you know, 
I, I think Chris Seaver has disowned pocket tails. Obviously, he didn't play a role in that game. And and Bad Fur Day is his vision. And, and so it is what it is. And I think Rare, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, the, you know, Bad Fur Day is part of Rare Replay. That is what all the merchandise is based on. So mm-hmm. you're, you're not going to see many references to the evil acorn or Ted the Boat Builder unless you create your own adventure in Project Spark. Uh, and incorporate that <laughs> mythology, which, uh, even though I never finished it, or I still haven't finished it, I, I, it was a great delight of mine to have Birdie reference Ted the Boat Builder in dialogue so, <laughs> <laughs> when I was trying to create my own game in Project Spark. So, Conquer, though, he, he's different than, than he was in his first two appearances, obviously. He, uh, now, according to to the game's literature and official, you know, promotional stuff. Conquer is now 21. Uh, Chris Seaver would argue he's like 15 here. Um, which I... All, yeah, all the, the official material, including the back of the box, says that the uh, the night out that Conquer is recovering from it was, in fact, his 21st birthday. Although that's never referenced in game that it was actually his birthday. It, it just seemed like another night. And if it if it was his birthday, why wasn't he with his girlfriend? So I think that's a holdover from from 12 Tales when like you were it was a celebration and all the presents got stolen and like that again carried over into pocket tales where it was a birthday celebration and presents getting stolen so i think yeah. that was just one of those things that that carried over there there were no presents stolen here though but i you know i i do like obviously word of god our stance is that it extends only so far as it doesn't contradict what's presented in game and and you know as much as I respect Seaver's vision here, I can't honestly say that Conquer comes across as 15 or, or however old he was said to be by Seaver. Uh, for me, Conquer is a jaded young adult. And mm-hmm. so much of this game really to me is the, the, the bad decisions you make to try to become mm-hmm. an adult, to try to emulate adulthood and and how much adulthood can kick your ass. Um, so I hear that conquer conquer though. You know he he still has some heroic qualities to him. Sometimes he he like yeah. seems to want to do the right thing, but he has become jaded, cynical. He he's more interested in money and sex and alcohol than he is. Um, the greater well, good. He he talks a big game about money, and obviously you're collecting money throughout the game. But money is more of a like, I wonder if I can get some money out of this type thing. He says after he's begrudgingly done the right thing anyway, because there's there's multiple points throughout the game where he gets caught up in somebody else's problems, and you can tell he. He doesn't really want to deal with this right now, but he feels obligated to help. <laughs> so, yeah, as you say, he's still got some some heroic tendencies there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I, I've I, you know attributed Conker's shift over the almost two years since we last saw him in, in Pocket Tales as him and Barry just being toxic for each other and then bringing out <laughs> their worst qualities. I, I said this on the last episode, and that's just my own fan in, of course, but it it would be the big thing to explain the personality shift with, with Conker and Barry, because Barry, too, is just a horrible person in this game. And, she, like, Barry, Barry, her whole design was shifted... Obviously, in Twelve Tales and Pocket Tales, she was this stout little chipmunk with brown fur, mm-hmm. you know, a little skirt, uh, brown hair. I really like that design. I think it's an adorable design, honestly. Actually, if you, if you look at the, the video footage that we have of Twelve Tales, there's like three different designs for Barry. Um, she right, yeah. it, it's mostly just the the coloring and she goes from yeah the, how she looks in pocket tails to um sort of different uh fur and hair colors 
And I think in the the latest chronological one, she has blonde hair and gray fur like she does in Bad Fur Day. And then in Young Conquer, she's got a nice middle ground where she's got like gray fur and brown hair. So... So yeah. she's clearly a dye job, is is what you're saying in Bad Fur Day. <laughs> I mean, c- canonically, Barry is like d- does have brown fur, brown hair at at least because not only did pocket tails come out, but she was also referenced in Banjo Kazooie in in Rusty Bucket Bay. Her portrait, an autographed portrait of her, is hanging in one of the sailors' bunks. Um, oh, is it so autographed? I never noticed that. It is autographed, yeah. I and so that that's where my idea in 1998 that Barry was like some sort of celebrity, like maybe like a an an actor or a pop star or something. Mm. I, I don't I don't know, but that that put that idea in my head, which is nowhere supported in these games. But um, <laughs> yeah, Barry's got gray fur now blonde hair and she is like six feet tall or at least appears to be uh in comparison to conquer who like comes up to her knees or something <laughs> yeah uh, there's like there's two sizes of people in this game they're either berry height or they're conquer height so you well, get like Barry. the ogas so- which are conquer height and then you get like the Stone Guys and Batula, which are Barry height. <laughs> but then like, you've got yeah. the actual human sized characters like uh Bugga the Knot and Jugga. A- and Jugga mm. can hold Conquer in her hands, and it's actually human squirrel like accurate size uh ratios oh, there. God, I never thought about that. So, Weird. yeah, because you think Bug of the Nut and Jug are giants, and then you realize, no, wait, they're just human-sized, and Conker is a squirrel. Oh, my so- God, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> yeah, when I realized that, which wasn't for several years, this is why when I Photoshop DKU characters together, size is always <laughs> varies, right? Like, in all these games, uh and I used to rag the Mario franchise for like portraying Bowser as a giant in one game and being <laughs> Mario size the next. But it, it's done throughout the entire DKU as well. Diddy mm-hmm. is the same size as K. Rool in Donkey Kong Land, and K. Rool is a massive giant in Donkey Kong 64 in that one scene, uh, in, in the final <laughs> boss fight, but not the rest of the game. Anyway, yeah. uh, which led me to my fanon that he's in a robotic boxing suit, but I digress. <laughs> uh, so that's why I always Photoshop Conquer to be much, much smaller than, say, Donkey Kong, because it's like, oh, he's a squirrel. He's actually this size. So it's mm-hmm. interesting when you look at Conquer's Bad Fur Day through that prism, like everything is well, scaled you know, for woodland yeah. rodent size where applicable. Um, that's why that's why the Panther King throne doesn't fit him. Mm hmm. I'm looking over at my uh, first four figure statue yeah, right now. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's panther sized. That's a pan, or maybe a weasel sized throne. Hmm. Yeah. So many kings in this. So Barry is is presented to her. Her vocals are it's with a vocal fry that accent like the valley girl kind of yeah it's um, very clueless yeah and she's portrayed as like sort of ditzy and mm, i don't know if i'd say she talks like that but she she's actually portrayed ditzy, yeah. very as very competent like, yes she's got her act together and and very insidious a little bit too. Um, mm-hmm. But I I would say I don't like Barry in this game. <laughs> I I and it, it's it's a shame too because you know Rare has always done a great job in my opinion of having strong like female women characters. You know Dixie Kong Kazooie. And Crystal, even to an extent, even though she was mm. massively sidelined in Adventures, B- Barry is. <laughs> yeah, like I was, I was surprised because, like in in preparation for this series, I I did a uh, fresh, full Bad Fur Day playthrough because normally I just like 
go back and play the chapters I like, and it had been a while since I played the full thing. And I was kind of surprised at, A, how little Barry's actually in it, and B, that her her personality wasn't quite what I remembered. And, like, I played through Young Conquer and did some, some video recording of that for um, DK Vine uh, in the not too distant past. And I, I think a lot of my appreciation for a character actually stems from that, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm desperate to play young conquer to kind of recontextualize like the middle ground between pocket tales and bad. I Fur mean, Day. I did do those recordings. You can watch them. It's not the same as experiencing. I, it. I, I know it's super not, uh, <laughs> Trust me. I and know. I don't really want to spoil it for myself. I've seen a little bit, but mm. I really feel like uh, I would. Uh, it would be a game I would actually appreciate, mm. especially since it's just. Oh, I super think you would. A conquer lore dive and 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 almost like a, a bandage between uh, like the two eras of conquer. So anyway, yeah, Barry. It's weird that like the game is presented. It begins it says starring conquer and Barry, and Barry. Mm-hmm factors in so little like uh, up just you know the very end she really plays a large role but i think it's more of an artifact of the fact that she used to be the co-star of the game and maybe that it's just a nod to that even if it's not accurate in in the present but yeah yeah, i i just get the impression that conquer and barry brought out the worst in each other and that's essentially where they're at Obviously, spoilers, Barry dies at the end of the game, but I feel like, you know, there's this argument to be, uh, there's this trope in in fiction, and it's been referred to as women in refrigerators, which actually refers to... Thanks, Green Lantern. Yes, it it refers... So, I actually owned and read this issue when it came out. Um, I'm proud of you, kind of. I don't know. Well, you were reading Kyle issues. Dude, Kyle Rayner was a good a character, all right? Better than mm. Hal Jordan. I'll fight you on this. Oh, yeah, that's a low bar. Come on. Okay, but I'm saying he replaced <laughs> Hal Jordan, so... But, no, <laughs> Kyle Rayner, his era as Green Lantern in the 1990s. It was 1994, and he'd been Green Lantern for several issues. He had a girlfriend named Alex, and essentially what happened was... A supervillain named Major Force. It was the nineties. He uh, murdered Kyle's girlfriend and stuffed her body in the refrigerator for Kyle to find. And the death meant nothing except as a way to motivate the male hero. And that kind of put a spotlight on this trope of the girlfriend character getting killed to as and sort then of. They- had him hook up with a other woman who was much younger, but got like time stamped into an older body and yada, yada, yada. It's no, that was Hal Jordan. Um, was it? Yeah. Uh, I get him confused. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Uh, <laughs> Kyle dated, uh, Wonder I blame zero Girl. hour for my memories. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Kyle's my Green Lantern, and then Hal Jordan came back, mm. and then I was like, eh. And then I'm Ryan I'm Reynolds. a Scott Allen fan, so Alan Scott actually. Yeah, it depends on which universe you're talking about. But yes, <laughs> I am a fan of Golden Age Green Lantern. Um, he just came back in the comics. Uh, he just, uh... yeah, yeah. He... They they wrote out the the gay version from the new fifty two and brought back the classic one again. So I have mixed feelings about it. He um. he. But then the the golden age one came out of the closet and to his children and and revealed himself to be a gay man. So oh, I missed that. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So they've just basically consolidated the two into one. Nice. I'll have to go track that down. Anyway, uh, sorry for this. Oops, I, all in tangents. what is completely appropriate for this episode, a blue coat just fell down past my window from a higher story. <laughs> what? Did he conquer just kill himself? I I don't know. <laughs> um. Anyway, I I would argue, and, and maybe I shouldn't be the one to argue this, but I feel like Barry and her death isn't really the women in refrigerators trope. 
at least to a one to one comparison. Mostly because Barry is just as much culpable culpable in her death uh, as Conker is, and, and I feel like. You know, Conker at one point in time would have also died at the end of Bad Fur Day. So yeah, it, it, it's and not we, so much. We know that... there's versions of the script where she didn't die, and there's aborted sequels where she came back. So you yeah, know, it. I I think that you know had things gone differently, and like maybe Don Weasel or you know somebody like m- killed Barry. Just as an aside, and conquer, you know, as a way to motivate conquer, then yeah, that would be the trope. But Barry mm-hmm. was pretty active uh, in in the wanton death and destruction at the end of the game, and, mm-hmm. and so yeah, it's she she's not much of a character, um, honestly. <laughs> maybe, maybe young conquer adds more depth to her again, but. Mm-hmm. As far as Bad Fur Day goes, eh, like, I, I struggle with this because I like Conker. I like his corner of the Hong Kong universe, but he's not a character I would really want to spend time with or actually visit his side of the world. Like, it, there, there are, there's enough off-putting things about him that make him an interesting character, but not a character mm-hmm. I would want to hang out with, like your Diddy Kongs or your Banjos, uh... Yeah, not not in this stage in his life, anyway. <laughs> Maybe Big Reunion, because I, I like that the Big Reunion Conquer, uh, which takes place 10 years after this game, has him sort of broken and, and sort yeah, of reflective yeah. and, like, sort of owning up to who he was and what he became, and which is, in my mind, the perfect way to take a Conquer sequel. So, I, I you love Young Conquer. Or you at least respect Young Conquer for what it is. Mm-hmm. I love Big Reunion, and people are going to complain about oh, that yeah. in the comments, I'm sure. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Conquer and Barry, yeah, they're they're very flawed individuals, and uh, they they be, they're pawns in this story, but then they're very also they, there's some instant karma for their actions that. Uh, there, there's blood on their hands, and then there's there's blood shed from them as well. Blood and tears. The antagonist, or at least two of the antagonists, or rather the main yeah. antagonist and the sh- like, the fake out antagonist, uh, yeah, yeah. the professor and Panther King. And the professor, let me just clear this up right now. He has a full name, which we've mentioned before on this we, podcast we are, in, in the early days and i i we've mentioned that he has a full name and i'd rather not mention what the full name is <laughs> right because his full name contains a slur that you know just like all of comedy in the last 20 years you know we've evolved over time and we can now say that hasn't held up well and so you know <laughs> due respect we won't uh. say his full name here at DK yeah. Vine, we've just taken to calling him Zipper Fesser, which is what he's called in game enough where we can just use that as a shorthand. And we, we, mm-hmm. we won't say his full name, but basically, Zipper Professor is mm-hmm. Dr. Strangelove um, from off of Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, on how I kind of, stuff kind of a uh, uh, mix between Dr. Strangelove and Davros from Doctor Who. Yeah, I mean, he's basically a Nazi scientist. Uh, he, well, I mean specifically, like he's got the one eyepiece and the prosthetic claw arm, and he's in the the hover chair thing. Like that's sure. all Devros. There, so. there are different elements pulled into his mad scientist character. And by the way, can I just point out how many mad scientists are in the DKU? We we've got there's a lot of them. We've got the professor K. Rule and his Baron K. Rulenstein uh, alias. We've got Klungo, mm-hmm. we've got Dr. Crackpot from Grab by the Ghoulies, we've got Dr. Mm-hmm. Quack from Ukulele. Mm-hmm. So many mad scientists. The Dr. Professor, Crack though, another Davros pastiche. <laughs> yeah, but but the Professor is, you know, he's, he's got a very exaggerated German accent. Uh, he, 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 that's where the Dr. Strangelove aspect comes in. Kind of like mm-hmm. those, you know, Cold War era Nazi scientists who were brought in, you know, and, mm-hmm. and 
he, he he's also a Nazi in that he creates fascist teddy bears. And and there's there's not so much <laughs> like a real like racial ideology component in this kind of faux Nazi uh, army of his. Uh, but they're, they're, they're fascist teddy bears. And so, <laughs> you know, that really plays into Chris Seaver's, uh, clear, uh, fascination with World War II and the Blitz. Yeah. And you see yeah, that. Yeah, that shows back up later in his, his other works as well. And of course, you know, the, the whole Teddies. Teddies really become the primary antagonist in the Conquer series. Uh, more so than the Professor and the Panther King and Don Weasel. Like, the Teddies are the ones that show up in Big Reunion, uh, live mm-hmm. and reloaded, the whole multiplayer campaign centered around the Teddies. So, yeah, but but the Professor was there as, like, was the there. boss character. Sure, yeah. But I'm just saying you can also have Teddies independent of the Professor. The Professor That's d- true. dies in this game, and the Teddies... And, and you mentioned Davros uh, from from off of Doctor Who. <laughs> the Teddies too are very much Dal. I I can't. I always mispronounce this, and I always get yelled at by our UK friends. D- it's Daleks. D- I, Dal- I can't say it. Daleks. Wario. Wario. Uh, <laughs> but they're very much yeah. the, the Teddies because they they always get wiped out almost to the verge of extinction and then through mm-hmm. various means like cloning and whatnot they come back and, yeah. and big reunion is all about the teddies clawing their way back after 10 years through... yeah i would have liked to see other bad days uh jurassic park 2 second site uh second location uh reference with the teddies coming yeah. back there yeah yeah but in canon in in the release chronology they came back uh, like a, a teddy or two survived and they cloned themselves and to get money to uh, fund their cloning, they essentially, they opened up a brewery, a brewery, a, brewery, a microbrewery. Yeah. yeah. In, in mm-hmm. uh, like Willow Wood. I think Big Reunion takes place uh, around the cock and plucker. And I think the cock and yeah, plucker cock and actually water. takes place between the Panther Kingdom and the uh, Willow Woods location established in Pocket Tales. Because yeah. In in the course of uh, researching for these episodes, I've become convinced that Timbers Island is between those two. Oh my god! Well, you go further than I do, but uh, you know it's funny you say <laughs> I'll that. I'll explain though, because, why later. <laughs> well, when I was when Diddy Kong Racing was out, and that was the only like conquer media that was officially released, and I was parsing through Twelve Tales, I was wondering if. 12 tales is going to be set on timbers island and like even though yeah the, like like, like i noticed that a lot of the 12 tales and pocket tales areas correspond to diddy kong racing worlds <laughs> like right sort of one for one yeah it, it you know so for a while there i was convinced that pocket tales and willow woods took place on the top of timbers island like the regions Ooh. of timbers island you can't really reach like the mountain tops uh, that are mm. mentioned in the game, like the mountain villages where Pipsy lives, and you actually race Whiz Pig, but you don't really get to explore it in full depth. And mm. I, I've changed my view since then. I think Willow Woods is the most northernly, and I say Willow Woods as a blanket term. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they 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 establish it as Panther Kingdom in Bad Fur Day going forward, but. Um, I, I think it's the most northernly area in the rare archipelago. It's it's definitely the one that has the maybe most the Panther Britishism. Kingdom's like the United Kingdom. M- maybe yeah. There's just the the United Kingdom, and then there's Great Britain, and then there's England, and mm-hmm, just yeah, yeah, two different islands. And they're all the side of like Wyoming, so you could co- probably walk across it in a day. Um. <laughs> so anyway, um. The, the professor, though, he, he is the Nazi scientist, and it's alleged or alluded to that he is the Weasel King of Yore. Yeah, who, who, has ex- who has beef with the Panther King and the squirrels. <laughs> yes, um, uh, who's he's extended his life, as has the Panther King, through unnatural means, and well i don't know the panther king might just have gone through his nine lives as greg was complaining about cats 
Um, sure, sure. Uh, but all that wouldn't explain the professor, though. Yeah, well, he's he's Devra, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's in in Bad Fur Day at least. It's alleged, or you're left to infer that he is the Weasel King, who is this place in Milk Wars. The Panther King cut off his legs, and somehow then he became subservient to the Panther King and his his science guy, his his science advisor, his Klungo, uh, if you yeah. will, his Doctor Crackpot, his Doctor Quack. There's always a, a sidekick oh, mad scientist. So, side note, we, we talked last episode a bit about how Twelve Tales was interrupted as the team was diverted to help out on Donkey Kong 64. And I was looking at Snide, and in an earlier version of the script, uh, Snide's character is a little different in that he is K. Rule's science guy who never gets to work on like actual stuff because K rule he's complaining about how K rule keeps having him like change the light bulbs or fix the door. And so he's conspiring against him and uh, roping the Kongs into his plans of getting back at the, the evil dictator he ostensibly serves. And I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) Well, this and you know, really Snide familiar. is a weasel, and actually yeah, yeah. marked the DKU debut of weasels. So, in in my head canon, and I I actually think there's enough in the games to support this. He is from the Panther Kingdom. He maybe even you oh, know was yeah. part of the Panther King's court, and you know maybe worked with the Professor. And then when K. Rule was displaced uh, following the events of the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. He had to bring in like non Kremlin help to to build mm, the, uh, yeah. the mechanical crocodile isle and the blastomatic. So he enlisted this weasel scientist from the Panther Kingdom, who then I came, believe you know, it. Yeah, and then except Donko sixty four in the final story, uh, Snide helped him build everything, and then K. Rule fired him without payment, and that was Snide's source of beef. Hmm. Yeah. Panther Makes me, King. me, yeah. Go ahead. Panther nah, King. Just, yeah, the Panther King. Uh, he, you're, you're made to think the Panther King is going to be the main villain, but it, it's very much, you know, we talk a lot about the parallels in all the rare games, and the Panther King is your general scales, uh, or even your chaos, mm. maybe, but more general scales in that, I mean, you know the professor is a bad guy, and you know he's yeah. driving a lot of what's happening. You can kind of figure out, I mean, you know he hates the Panther King from his dialogue, but you really don't un- grasp all of the professor's machinations until the very end. Yeah, yeah. The Panther King, he is, he seems to be senile and kind of, he, he he's a king... But he's very withdrawn from everything that's happening. It reminds me of uh, a more recent example of the same sort of thing is in um, Wolfenstein 2, the new Wolfenstein 2, where uh, Billy is uh, masquerading as a uh, a Nazi to infiltrate the, the party. He gets to meet Hitler in the present day of the game, and he's just old and senile and reminded me very much of the panther king in bad fur day so and and uh, this wouldn't be really a contemporary reference because bad fur day came out in 2001 um and unless it was inspired by the the actual books but um i I sort of get the sense too of uh lord of the rings the two towers uh Mm. theoden the king of uh, rohan when he's yeah, kind under, of like that. under uh, Saruman's um, thrall a little bit, and he's just kind of this empty vessel sitting on a throne. Panther King has a little mm-hmm. bit more um, agency than that. Like, I, I, and the professor isn't really a worm tongue so much because he he is uh, he's more the driving force of evil in the game, but. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's weird because the Panther King, there, there's clearly like a Panther Kingdom that's established, but yeah. you, you, you listen to Conquer and he thinks the Panther King doesn't even exist. Like, because obviously yeah. the Panther King has been sitting on the throne for centuries. 
and nobody really Barry sees doesn't him know anymore. who he is yeah. yeah so it's like well this castle's right here how does this government work if people think there's no king anymore uh, and so and you know that you can tie that into pocket tales and and this whole like sub governments that the acorn people run like you've got the <laughs> forest wong and the forest guardian like doing their own yeah. thing over there and so it, it kind of all works as a piece, even if it's not meant to work together. Even if bad for it is, just like we're not going to pay any attention to pocket tales. Yeah, a remarkable amount. A remarkable amount of rare stuff sort of serendipitously works together. <laughs> I mean, that's basically Donkey Kong continuity as a whole. <laughs> I, I mean, it somehow yeah. all hangs together. You know, being developed across three different continents over the last 25 years, yet, yet it all <laughs> kind of plays off each other. I think when you don't have, like, a very, very rigid continuity, but you have just enough to go off of, um, and you have enough iconic elements that that people like to reference them it it can somehow work it's when you try to <laughs> define it in a hard and fast way like zelda that it really starts to fall apart after the fact <laughs> i think zelda actually really worked until miyamoto got involved but that's a whole a different rant that's so. the, uh yeah let's not go on any more we already went on a green lantern rant <laughs> can't can't afford um but, uh, yeah, so th those are the four main characters, sort of. The Panther mm -hmm. King is just yeah. this this daffy old man, sort of, who's just sitting there. He, he just wants to drink his milk without it spilling, and that's... <laughs> That's, that's all he's got going on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that, like, he's he's such a presence and seemingly driving force in this game and it's it's interesting looking at the the other bad day notes and seeing the the sort of co-leading role he would have taken there and yeah it's it's hmm. i feel like over the course of the series a lot of these characters uh go through a character change no pun intended because like the professor in bad fur day is very sort of bumbling and almost content competent but then mm. in later games he's presented as a much more sort of clinically intelligent evil scientist rather than like bumbling sidekick angry scientist well and i think and, like that's too the dr strange love kind of it, it, it it's it's sort of like that's where i see the parallels there where you know and I think, too, like, anytime you portray Nazis in anything, and there is this desire to portray them as bumbling and inept and yeah, incompetent in one, yeah, on one hand, fair. and as pure evil on the other, I think the only way we can process the true horrors of what they are is to kind of make them, like, almost... Um, sort of neuter it a bit and make them mm -hmm. kind of be idiots because i, I blame the comprehend. producers and and donald duck um <laughs> and i'll say indiana jones there um, uh yeah that's fair yeah yeah and there's there is an uh an indiana jones reference in conquer where he says teddy's i hate these guys which is a yeah yeah and an, an, a reappropriated indie line but th those those are the four characters like i said there's don weasel there's some other major characters like greg the grim reaper and <sighs> i wouldn't Oh, man, considering how how much Greg and Birdie are held up in the the greater fandom and advertising and just the the fan community and stuff, they're sure not in this a whole lot. They they are not. Although uh, I would say that Birdie has kind of become the de facto um, fifth most important character, mm. just based yeah. on his role in Big Reunion. He, like, the big it, reunion it's and the fact that he's he's one of the characters that we visibly got to see carry over from Twelve Tales. Yeah, yeah, he really went through a change here. So let let's just start because we're if we're going to discuss Birdie, we might as well. Yeah, yeah, we might as well discuss. So the, so yeah. setting the scene, 
we have a, a pub and Conker making a drunk phone call, sort of doing the, the tropey making excuses to the, the significant other as why you're not coming home and you're going to continue drinking with the lads. Um, and he, he uh, wanders out of the pub just completely shit-faced, pukes on a monk, and uh, okay, okay, takes... <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask you this, because I I don't understand the monks that appear, like, twice, or, or maybe three times in this uh, game. What are the what? monks? What, what do you mean, what are the monks? What are they monks of? Like, where... <laughs> That's... You know what? I bet this is answered in the guide. Hold on. <laughs> because the guide, the guide is, is, uh, the, if you were unaware, the official Nintendo player's guide for Conker's Bad Fur Day is written in the style of an in-universe sort of, uh, hitchhiker's guide to the Panther Kingdom, uh, one that is previously owned by Conker, so his notes are scribbled all over it, but it was, in fact, written by the monk, uh, that Conker puked on in this opening cutscene, and that'd be, uh, Brother Clavius a former cloistered monk from the fundamentalist non-reformed cult of the high gobbling authority. Okay, then. I need to get this guide because I did not Fortunately really for that. you, I scanned it all and put it on archive.org. Well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, so so I know the the player's guide calls them goblins. Um Gobbling, yeah, yes. something, yeah. But they're they're all like so they're like they've also been referred to as imps. So it, it, they're I I we'll refer to them as both, just like we refer to <laughs> King alternately as Willow Woods. But um, that that's that's very good lore. Thank you for that lore drop. Um, there's there's bits in that guide that I swear DK Vine could have written circa two thousand one. Yeah. I I wonder like how much of this like is just invented by Nintendo Power or how much of it is actually from Rare that never actually got published anywhere else. Um that's a good question. I know they thank the uh Nintendo of America people in this. Um but I don't know if Rare actually had anything to do with it. <laughs> but I mean that it's it's fine because you know, it's like the the name Shabunga for Star Fox Adventures. Yeah, we don't yeah. actually think that name came from Rare because nobody at Rare seems to have any knowledge of it, aside from Chris Alcock, who's just basically a Rare nerd like us who happens to work for and with Rare. So, mm -hmm. I think like they they just call him like the shopkeeper, and <laughs> so the Shabunga is basically a slightly higher tier of fanon, but we're still gonna mm -hmm. roll with it because he's Shabunga. Damn it. Like there's there's nothing in this guide that contradicts anything in the games, so I say let's roll with it. Sure, and at this point, it doesn't really matter because it's been twenty years, and Conquer's, <laughs> the Conquer series is already rife with contradictions that we can we always try to smooth over. So what's a few more mm -hmm. along the way? Uh, you, you know, you mentioned him drinking with the lads. This is also where we get the first glimpse that there is this major conflict happening in the background because yeah the and is it's full of soldiers uh-huh and it's just sort of a throwaway line as conquer is like yeah they're going off to some war in the morning or whatever and you don't really think much about it um you think like it's very easy to if you don't know what's coming and this is your first playthrough to just sort of assume that this is part of conquer's bullshitting <laughs> um and, you know, as somebody who's very, you know, engaged you know, politically and with the news, I even even back in 2001, I I was like, I didn't understand how Conker could, like, be oblivious to the fact that there was this major war happening fucking right off the coast, like, uh, uh, of his home. And well, um, that's, like... The, I think it comes up in in the It's War chapter, and it's it's mentioned in the guide and the manual, and that's uh, only gray squirrels are required to sign up for selective service. As a red squirrel, Conker doesn't even have to fucking worry about it. 
And that's probably but, a holdover from the days when the red squirrels ruled the land. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, but, like, you would think that, like, you you would just, like, actually know about it. But I, I, think, I think it works, though, that Conker and Barry are, like, basically oblivious. Because they're so self-absorbed at this point. They're so just wrapped mm-hmm. up in their own vices and and the pleasure centers of their brain that they they mm-hmm. can't see what's happening in the broader world around them to the point where Conker's drinking with these soldiers and it doesn't even really register to him that the teddies have returned and are waging war on the Panther Kingdom and the Squirrel High Command is is fighting them and like it it works to me like at having spent twenty more years on this earth. And I see how oblivious people are to horrific events Ugh. going on around them. I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The last couple of years have really put all of those, like, why would somebody deny the zombie plague that's happening all around them? And it's like, oh, yeah, no. No, in fact, the movies are being too generous. The characters are being too smart. It's not realistic. Uh. <laughs> Although I thought you were referencing the spooky chapter here at first, and I was like, it's, "I don't think it's so much a zombie." Pl- well, 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 we'll we'll say that for the we'll next episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we still haven't even got through hungover. My God. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Conquer, conquers drunk off his noggin, wanders out, pukes on Brother Clavius, and takes a wrong turn. <laughs> yeah. So. He obviously knows where the cock and plucker is because that's his pub. That's that's he frequents it uh, probably on a semi nightly basis. So assuming that, you know, Conker and Barry live, you know, in Willow Woods still from Pocket Tales, he, mm-hmm. you got to get from there to the cock and plucker, which is the, the area around the cock and plucker is where big reunion takes place, by the way. So yeah, we see yeah. more of that general area. But then Conquer veers further away into the Panther Kingdom, and this yeah. is where he's completely lost. And and there's the the the, the sign, uh, nice and nasty, and uh, I guess the Panther Kingdom is is the nasty because uh, it it is full of degenerates and horrific weirdos. And and this is where Conker passes out and wakes up the next morning. He wakes up in um, Birdie the Scarecrow's yeah. garden patch, or the 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 garden that Birdie is um, he, watching he is over to watch. Yeah. Yes. So Birdie, let's let's discuss Birdie a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of in jokes between Chris Seaver and Robin Beelan. <laughs> yes. Birdie is just one big in joke. Um, he, he's a scarecrow, but he, he's he's an explicit reference to um, a, a a rare beardy is is the is is the is the reference. Um, but he is uh, equally a, as equally a drunkard as Conker, seemingly. Um, Not just a drunkard, but he just he, he he's a he's a fucking weirdo who likes to guzzle helium. Like like <laughs> I say, like, I don't just like alcohol. I also like to just inhale gases. And this was I don't know. This sort of sets the tone of the game where he you you stumble up to Birdie and talk to him, and he explains context sensitive pads to you. Very stiltingly. Explain and, context sensitive pads to the audience. Uh they're they're sensitive to context. Um I was was talking with my friend um Milo about this and some other people on Discord, and it's sort of uh kind of amazing how these days, having context-sensitive action buttons where you, you press a button and the character interacts with whatever it is in front of them as necessary, um, as just sort of being how games are, trademark, yeah, capital letters, uh, this was not always the case. Uh, the, traditionally, games had a, a menu of different types of actions you could use to interact with a thing that you'd kind of have to go through 
or press specific buttons like even dinosaur planet which would have come out after this had like specific sort of menus you'd have to scroll through to pick the correct thing to interact with a given puzzle or npc to activate stuff so the fact that bad fur day was doing this here's an indicator uh that where you walk up to this thing and you press the b button and an action specific to the environment and scenario you in you are in will occur and that was kind of a big deal at the time (laughs) like that like nobody did that like it was kind of crazy for more on context sensitive pads please watch the episode of the kong parison hosted by jeff onan (laughs) that you gibbon also appear in it it is it's actually on our youtube channel or will be up on our youtube channel uh shortly before this episode goes live so uh, you have a whole discussion about context-sensitive pads. Also, our friend Mitchell Wolf phones in and talks about how much he hates context-sensitive <laughs> pads. So it's an interesting yeah. discussion that I feel like we don't really even need to get into much here because yeah. it's already been done. In in the context, haha, of of today's gaming landscape, they're not really much. But at the time, they were sort of hot shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> And uh, Birdie, Birdie explains those to you and sends you along your merry way. And yeah. Yeah. And, and so basically this whole area around Birdie's garden, one, it's the nicest area of the Panther Kingdom. <laughs> it's the only area of the Panther Kingdom I would want to spend any time just it's, hanging it's out in the garden. the only area of the Panther Kingdom that still has 12 Tails assets in it. It's got the little bouncing, dancing mushrooms and flowers and stuff. The, and... the sunflowers, which uh, th- there is a sunflower that comes back back in in mm-hmm. later on uh, in the game but she's she's been given a bad fur day makeover uh but yeah you, you got the bouncing sunflowers which appear on the conqueror's pocket tails box art by mm-hmm. the way and it, it's it's a nice lovely area but it's essentially the spiral mountain uh training area of Bad Fur Day, which i guess makes birdie sort of the bottles figure of the mm-hmm. game he's, he's I wouldn't sort of even... your I honestly, I don't know why hungover is not just part of windy because it's, it's more like the part of spiral mountain going from Banjo's house to like the main roundabout. (laughs) Like it's really short. It is, it is. uh, But this is where you kind of get a handle on the controls, which, Mm -hmm. you know, after playing Banjo and even Donkey Kong 64, take a bit of time getting used to. Let, uh, mm, Bad Fur Day fair. feels so much looser, and it, it 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 can take a bit of time to really get a handle on Conquer. Like this, this is like I said, this is a 3D platformer that isn't really known for its to borrow a phrase from our friend Josh Wallen, the Geek Critique. Uh, it's not really known for its crunchy controls. It's tight, crunchy controls. Uh, it, yeah, it, it I is, was noting it's. Its control scheme is more akin to Grand Theft Auto. You've got yeah. a bit of a turn radius. You've got some momentum. Um, your your melee is a little imprecise. Uh, the focus is more on the the context sensitive stuff and the puzzle solving than it is the the platforming and the combat. But it works, and like that's why I'm really thankful. Like I can't tell you how many times I've fallen down into the water trying to get up, you know, the path to the gargoyle but i can tell you that it took me about half an hour to do that without fucking up <laughs> this is probably why they 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 separate this into its own chapter because it's just like you know what you're probably right yeah yeah uh but you know you get the hang of it and it never really like once you get in in sync with the game once once you kind of tune into the game's wavelength it never yeah. becomes a problem i mean yeah revisiting this area later in the game i just kind of breezed through it no problem and it's like why did it take me 25 minutes to get up this fucking path without falling into the water but when you first start out it does take some adjustment yeah um and i mentioned the gargoyle there, there's a, yeah the the other major character in this um 
in this little area besides the key, uh, the, the googly-eyed key, is the uh, the gargoyle. Um, yeah. Who's just sitting on the bridge, blocking he's, your way. There's, there's some confusion over whether he's a gargoyle or a grotesque, and I only bring this up because it was a bit of a thing on the Conquer Wiki. Um, because he's referred to as both in different places, and there is actually a difference between those two things. And it's a gargoyle is specifically also a rain spout. Um, oh. in in architecture, so we don't we don't know where he was sitting on the Gothic architecture. So yeah, I mean, I, I think locally he's he's a, you know, what most people think of as a gargoyle, like Disney's gargoyle. Yeah, you know, just, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now I I I have to wonder too. He mentions Gothic architecture. Where was he sitting? Like what what was the Gothic Gothic architecture? that he originated from later. Uh, maybe, in the game. It, maybe he's, he's here because of the renovations going on over in spooky. Yeah. Like, like, was it, was it spooky or was it, um, the Panther King, the, 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 the castle, the, mm, the good Royal question. Castle. I don't um, know. We, hmm, we, we kind of see the castles outside as like, a background texture on the skybox in in various areas. But. Oh yeah, like the the the. I I don't like the term skybox. I know it's the term, but to me the sky it, it makes everything feel so artificial and, and yeah, closed. Yeah. I I just like for you can see the entire like um panoramic view of the Panther Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and you know if when especially when you get up high. Like in um, Barn Boys, like when you climb yeah, the barn, yeah. you 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 can get a good look around and see everything, and yeah, and and it's kind of remarkable the sense that you know because we mentioned Ooh. like how how Cam Cam in the viewer chat points out that uh, being from Spooky would probably make sense because the river drains into Hungover. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I am trying to think. I know Live and Reloaded added a lot to like, the surrounding area and spooky, like just outside of. Yeah, the and I'll have things to say about that next episode. But I, I'm just wondering if it like gave any illusion. I can't remember if it gave any illusions to because it's been a long time since I played Live and Reloaded. But if it, if it gave any like specific references to that was where the gargoyle might have originated from. Mm. Yeah, um, you, you you get a real sense of place throughout the game, and so for as much as we said it was like it seemed to be improv and tossed off, there was like they did lot, put a lot of effort, a lot of thought, it, yeah. yeah, put into it uh, where where it counts. So basically, this this whole sequence with the gargoyle is just designed to teach you to like to, for you to get the frying pan mm -hmm. as, as your primary well, weapon. Hmm, this is one thing I noticed in that Conker's not learning stuff in this section. Like the 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 broken bridge, he's like, wait, how did I do this again? And he remembers how to high jump and helicopter twirl. And then when he's chasing down the key, he goes, wait, didn't I have a... And then he digs around in his pocket and pulls out the frying pan. And it's sort of hearkening back to the fact that Conker is already a platforming mascot and has had, had adventures before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And he's, he's remembering how to do this stuff as he sort of gets over his hangover. It's sort of like in Grunny's revenge where like Banjo forgot his moves because of a mm. side effect of time travel. And that was how they kind of explain he's, he, he has to kind of relearn his stuff along the way. This is just conquer getting over his hangover and he happened to have a frying pan on him from some some drunken escapade the night before involves <laughs> a frying pan and he still had like it just kind of a, a tossed off joke like why would he have a frying pan why do you yeah. do anything when you're blind stinking drunk but it made sense <laughs> at the time and i was yeah, gonna use yeah. it as a weapon pretty much um yeah, so. and even even the gargoyle laughs at this a frying pan uh and and when conquer tries to attack him with it um because it's it's really not much of a weapon <laughs> but um it is that uh 
incredulous laughter that clears the way as the gargoyle tapple and uh, the, the gargoyle topples off of the bridge he's been sitting on and blocking your path. Yeah, yeah, and then you're in the main central hub of of the game. After that, uh, you, you cross the bridge and you're in the windy area. The, the chapter yeah. is windy. Um, but, uh, th- this, this is sort of your, your Grunny's Lair, your DK Isles of Conker's Bad Fur Day, in that yeah. this is, this is the, the, the hub where you pretty much access everything, mm, and you constantly yeah, return to it. Much. But, I think there's, you know, there's one chapter that's not directly accessible from Windy, in that you have to go through a different area to get to it, but the other seven chapters of the game are accessible from here. And Wendy also, it moves along the storyline and, mm. and it changes slightly. Like you'll return to Wendy after uh, completing a chapter and there'll be new characters or new events happening. And, mm-hmm. and it, you know, it, it just keeps, keeps the, the storyline for what it is moving along. Um, and it's, yeah. I, you know, you said like the the birdie area was like the only place that actually used twelve tails assets, but for me, like Windy feels the most twelve tails area in the game to me, yeah. just because it's got this upbeat music, it's got the you know the mm-hmm. the the iconic. I I think if there's any iconic conquer song from this game that is used as an identifier for the Conqueror oh, series, yeah. then it's, then it's definitely this song right here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's mostly sunny during the daytime and you got the nice colorful windmill in, in the middle, which is a holdover from 12 tails and mm-hmm. pocket tails. And, um, yeah, you've got all of these, as I said, degenerates hanging on the <laughs> margins of Windy. Yeah. But Windy itself is generally a somewhat pleasant place to be, sort of. Pretty much. Like, it's got the upbeat music, it's very colorful, it's probably the most um, calm place in the game, I want to say. Yeah. Like, very, very like there's the bees and there I guess the wasps but like very few like ambiently antagonistic stuff the wasps leave you alone unless you do a thing the the beetles leave you alone unless you do a thing and it's only those beetles the rest of the beetles don't really care about you yeah They're the rest either, of the beetles and... are more concerned about the poo monster yeah and like it's just a place that conquers wandering through and it's it's going about its day um yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should mention too uh the the two health oriented collectibles in the game uh, that's true uh and that is the anti gravity chocolate and I squirrel for- tails yeah i forgot that the professor was behind the anti gravity chocolate yeah, it's such again a fucking piss take. It's uh, it's a literal throwaway gag. Yes, because <laughs> the professor just... he's just invented this chocolate that these chocolate bars that float, and and he's just like, why why do I even have this? Why did I even do this? He throws it out the window, and I guess he throws enough of it out the window that he just spreads it across the land where Conker can collect it to replenish his health. And and just the fact that it like directly hangs a lampshade on the trope of video game collectibles that float for no mm-hmm. reason. Uh, we're gonna call it anti gravity chocolate yeah. invented by a mad Nazi. And there it's you go. It's actually the only such thing in the game. <laughs> Everything else is very grounded. Like the squirrel tails we mentioned are all hanging on stuff in the game yeah. on like like signposts or hooks on the wall or whatever the anti-gravity chocolate's the only thing that floats around like a traditional game power up and and conquer even comments at various points in the game once he gets some decent food that like oh god good i was getting sick of chocolate <laughs> sure, <laughs> stuff yeah, like that yeah. 
But yeah, a- anti gravity charm. I like to like just the the weird nature of like like banjo is is a bear, so he he you know honey replenishes him. Mm-hmm. The donk the the Kongs from Donkey Kong sixty four they love fruit so watermelons okay yeah sure uh, why and not and then Conker is a squirrel so not no chocolate chocolate yeah, yeah. I wonder because in Twelve Tales and Pocket Tales he's got like an acorn meter and I yeah really wonder how they got from there to a chocolate bar <laughs> I think it must have just been an in joke or just them trying to subvert expectations like yeah what, what if what if it's chocolate what, what if like, chocolate heals you i i like the nice segmented nature of it in that like you're breaking off hershey squares as you take damage yeah and and stuff and gaining them back as you eat more chocolate squares but like it's just so stupid yeah <laughs> pretty much i mean i think pretty much anytime we have a question why did they we can just sum it up by it they thought it was stupid therefore funny yeah yeah (laughs) but the squirrel tales okay so this is where the game really again revels in being convoluted nonsense yeah so the squirrel tales are He's never really explained why there are so many squirrel tails hanging around. But squirrel tails are the lives in the game. Mm-hmm. Interesting that they went with lives in the game because, like, again, Donkey Kong 64, um, Banjo Tooie had already been getting away from yeah, the concept especially, of lives. And yeah, like, they're almost superfluous because if you do actually game over. And you you pick up like you you get booted back to the main menu and you choose play again and it just drops you back in at the checkpoint you would have respawned at with your next life anyway with three more lives. I think it's just they wanted to play with the tropes and, mm. and at, at this point in two thousand one lives and game overs were still very much a trope in video games. Yeah, a holdover from the arcade days, and they they just wanted to have fun with it and kind of like comment on on the ludicrous nature of it and have these in universe like reasons for why this is the way it is. And and so this afforded them the opportunity to make act, the literal Grim Reaper death himself a character in the game who, you know, you you can go throughout the whole game without dying and then the first time you meet Greg, the Grim Reaper, will be in the spooky chapter. Or you can die beforehand and meet him uh, the first time you die. You, uh, if you die the first time, then you are whisked away to this afterlife realm this kind of like purgatory Mm -hmm. uh, gray zone where you meet the grim reaper who is named greg after greg males by Mm -hmm. the way so um it's funny too because so many people at rare when talking about bad fur day or or the conquer mythos just refer to him as death And, and i'm like where did Greg come from? Because I know Greg <laughs> came from Rare. I know that name came from Rare because it's Greg. Mm-hmm. It's, it's spelled like Greg Males with the extra G on the end. And yeah. it, I've seen it referenced as such through official Rare things. So, But it's just funny that that name doesn't stick with the people who actually worked on the game. Yeah, it's weird. Because like in-game, he introduces himself as Greg. But all other material refers to him as Death or the Grim Reaper. And it's like... Okay. <laughs> yeah, he gave us his name. Yeah, like let's let's respect it. Uh, but Greg, he is a stout little Grim Reaper who's conquer sized, and obviously, right? Like we we say, grab by the Ghoulies exists in the same shared universe as this, and that game also introduces a Grim Reaper, and there are a couple different explanations for how this can be. But the one I prefer is that Greg is the Grim Reaper of 
animals like cats and woodland mm. critters. He's specifically the dog catcher of Grim Reapers, yeah. and he hates it. He hates his life. <laughs> and, you know, he hates cats. He's always ranting about cats and their mm. nine lives and all of these stupid rules about who gets to come back and who doesn't. And one of the stupid rules, complete, like, not based in any mythology, not based in out of anything other than this being a game starring a red squirrel and we're going to play with video game logic. Red mm-hmm. squirrels can cheat death if they have tails to turn into the Grim Reaper when they die. Then they yeah. have to come back. That is a weird bylaw in in the whole Grim Reaper uh, occupation. Yeah, it's very... Just, again, dumb and ludicrous. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, but it works. And, you know, you mentioned how it's funny that Greg is this outsized character in the fandom and in some, like, materials. But he appears so little in the franchise. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, like, I've equated Greg as, like, the mumbo-jumbo, like, the breakout yeah. star of Bad Fur Day. But he's not really. He's not yeah. really there much. He, he, he appears the first time you die, and then he appears in the beginning of Spooky. And if you don't die before that, he's just kind of there. Um, And that's it. And yeah, he was going to apparently be the main character in Getting Medieval. Um, And he's, he's one of the Minecraft skins. But that's it. I guess he was he would have played a big part in Other Bad Day. He was going to be a bit of an, an antagonist in Other yeah, Bad Day. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was tired of Conqueror cheating death all the time, and he was going to do something about it. Which, I, I don't like that he was going to be an antagonist in Other Bad Day. Like because I, yeah. I think he's a fan-favorite character. A lot of us find him endearing. And it, it, it I think it, it would be kind of an inverse of what they did with Mumbo, where they kind of made Mumbo a more cutesy, uh, friendly character instead of just this ambiguous, kind of spooky weirdo. Mm -hmm. Um, They they, they kind of... um, Yeah, him... him sort of hanging out at the on the dock in Spooky and giving you a shotgun because he hates undead more than he hates you. Uh, Yeah. That's I like that character. I don't exactly. necessarily know if I would have would have cared for what they had planned for him in the the other bad day documents that they showed off. At least Seaver's already commented that like, and of course we'd already changed things from this. This is just the documents he had on hand to show people on Twitter. As much as I like a lot of the elements of uh, other bad day, especially like sailing the essentially the sea of the damned and meeting yeah, the, yeah. the great mighty poo. Uh, I I think. In some cases, we might have actually dodged a bullet with preserving the bits of Conquer lore we really like, like, like Greg, like, like, like Greg being this. Um, he he reminds me of the Bill and Ted Grim Reaper. Exact. Well, exactly. And I was gonna say, uh, it's funny you say that because the Grim Reaper in Grab by the Ghoulies actually plays, does the the air guitar. Yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. Um, but yeah, I mean that. I think I'd first seen Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, which, by the way, far superior to uh, Excellent Adventure. <laughs> Fucking don't care. I don't care. It's the better movie. But um, I, I'd seen that movie for the first time. Because this is also 2001 was the advent of DVDs, where DVDs were mm. really starting to catch on. I got my first DVD player. And was just like buying DVDs left and right because oh my god, this is amazing technology, and and all of these all of the stuff was coming out on DVD, TV shows included. This is where mm-hmm. the the ability to actually binge TV shows first came into vogue. And I was like, I got like the first couple seasons of the X Files, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god, I can watch this whenever I want. <laughs> this is incredible. But I got Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, I think at Costco, and uh, watched it loved it and my favorite character absolutely was death because i mean he he was just like mm-hmm. a grim reaper who is kind of worn down by his job and eventually becomes somewhat of an ally and uh just this likable 
like working stiff, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, Greg was kind of our version of that for Conqueror and the DKU. And uh, so I, I, I'm still very defensive of his character. Honestly, on my on my cork board right uh, next to me, to, to the left of me on my wall, I've got uh, a sticker of Greg drawn by our own Cameron Regal just cursing. And uh, he's just right <laughs> there because I like the character so much. I wanted them on, on my DK9 yeah, cork board. Yeah, he's pretty great. Anyway, uh so yeah, th- those are the the life giving mechanics of Bad Fur Day, both nonsense mm-hmm. in their own right. But but Windy itself, there are little set pieces that that occur in mm, Windy yeah, throughout the adventure. Um, throughout the adventure, you you have to do different things in Windy that kind of uh, move things along. Uh, and initially, there is the our introduction to the royal drama of the B family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so much royal drama in this game. Yes. And, this and... is this is more equivalent to the British royals in that it's just a lot of a, a lot of like eye rolling nonsense here between the the king and the queen. Yeah, and I think this is this is famously the scenario that they first voiceovered with the new direction, isn't it? Mammy, you would you would know more than I would. Yeah, I think this this hive retrieval was sort of the first go at the new direction after uh, the Bad Fur Day pitch happened, or maybe in the course of the Bad Fur Day pitch, as they were sort of seeing how it would go. And it's um, you you come across the queen bee who is uh, next to an empty, like, hive box slot, uh, weeping her eyes out because the hive has just been stolen by a bunch of hooligan wasps and you need to go retrieve it. And it's, yeah, it's really straightforward. You go up the path a bit and she's like, oh, where do I go? And she's like, oh, just follow the arrows. They'll show you. (laughs) Very, you know, again, lampooning video game tropes. Um... You, you grab the hive, you stay moving because the wasps are chasing you and stabbing into the ground after you with little Looney Tunes spurring noises. And you get the hive back to her and uh, it, it opens up into like a machine gun battery and she guns them all down in bloody glory. And yeah, that sort of sets the tone. I know I've said that a couple times, but it's like, oh, yeah, Tex Avery cartoon goodness combined with blood and guts. <laughs> yeah, it, it's subverting expectations and immediately letting you know what you're in for pretty much throughout the whole game from this point on. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. Yeah. Not and a whole then lot there to are, it. There, there are the Beatles, the dung yeah. Beatles. Yeah, uh, which which become kind of reoccurring characters up yeah. through up through the 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 <sighs> mountain sequence. I was was ruminating on this a bit. I mean that the the game is partially due to multiplayer and partially due to the fact that like the latter half of the game is the more popularly well known portion. But like most everybody remembers like the the squirrels the teddies and the weasels as like the main races of the game they're the ones that show up in multiplayer they're the ones that are focused on in live and reloaded they're the ones that show up in subsequent entries in the series uh they are largely completely absent from the first half of the game which is populated by uh various species of bee and beetle you see so many of these beetles around and so many of these bees and wasps around in like um, these first daytime chapters and, and nobody really ever talks about them or remembers that they play such a prominent role for like the first half of the game. I mean, I do because they have Liverpudlian accents <laughs> as a very obvious reference to the Beatles. So yeah. of course I, I remember them for that, but yeah, you're right. Like it, and I, I think, you know, I often say, and you're kind of steering me uh, correct here where 
like yes people remember the big set pieces of the day portions of the, of conquerors bad fur day but you're right they they just remember the set pieces the things that kind of uh glue them together are are overlooked or or not remembered well and, and part of that is like i think because the day portions have some of the less polished or refined areas bats tower but also <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just, it, it's, it is strange because you would think that the Dung Beetles would, I think, play a, a larger role. Of course, mm. they, they were never put into multiplayer. They were never really brought back outside of, you know, live and reloaded. Uh, re- yeah, there was, there was some speculation in one of the Discord servers I'm in that it's because uh, the the bees and wasps and Dung Beetles aren't, humanoid they as you say they don't show up in multiplayer they're not uh humanoid like the 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 main races of the series are they're they're kind of these oddballs in that respect they're they're insects um yeah and whether that's sort of intentional in that like the the npcs in the first half of the game are are literal insects that you trample over over the course of it or not um yeah that's just sort of how it shakes out but the the beetles here they they attack you at first and it's just to set up uh birdie comes back and he's yeah. like oh let me tell you how to use the slingshot which at one you know the slingshot is a holdover yeah. from from uh the the original uh, 12 tales mm-hmm. and of course it was the primary weapon in pocket tales yeah. so it's just one more thing like oh yeah conquer also has a slingshot although he he can only use it in context sensitive areas yeah and i think he only actually uses the slingshot here and in the beginning of its war maybe i maybe yeah because he uses other weapons and other points in the game like flamethrowers uh so (sighs) yeah yeah but it's it's funny how like they they still included the slingshot but they really Mm -hmm. just but it's just yeah here here's context sensitive here's another bit with that Here's aiming and firing that will come mm-hmm. into play later. More just setting the stage for what's to come and introducing the dung beetles who play a larger role in poo areas. Mm-hmm. You have to take out a couple dung beetles. They're like, ah, who's this little shit? We're going to fuck him up. Um, and you, you get a branch in the path. You can either go to the poo smelling branch of the path or the not poo smelling branch of the path. Um, and this actually isn't a choice because if you go into the poo area at this point, um, the door is locked and there's a sign on the door saying come back after 10 and Conker takes out his watch and it reads like 825 and he says, oh, I guess I'll come back later. And you are funneled into Barn Boys. Yes. Now, now in the actual chapter menu... Bat's Tower is listed first, right? Yes, Bat's Tower is listed before Barn Boys in the chapter menu, but you can't do it until after Barn Boys because it requires you having done a bit of this Pooh Mountain stuff first. Um, and the guide lists uh, Bat's Tower as chapter four and Barn Boys as chapter three. And I think that was corrected in later releases. <laughs> Okay. But I, that might just be a holdover of when these things were in a different arrangement. Because um, on the Cutting Room Floor website, there's a big, like, taped together scenario world map. And and some of these things were arranged differently. And you can kind of tell they were meant to be done in a different order. Or bits of one chapter were originally going to be in another chapter and what have you. So probably, probably just a holdover on the menu. It's also, it's also like staggering to me that things like the dung beetles and the like the wasp massacre all happen for 9 a.m <laughs> um mm, no not 9 a.m uh because yeah uh the wasp massacre doesn't happen until the second time you do the hive thing and that's after three so okay. right. yeah 
but right now it's it's not even half past eight and you're you're going to the farm yep yep barn boys which i think is outside of Pooh mountain uh and, and you know arguably ooga booga that whole area but but barn barn boys is in in this initial area the most iconic part probably because it's what people see the most yeah yeah just quit playing the game or whatever uh and and barn boys it's a a sprawling sprawling Mm -hmm. farmland yeah it's our first glimpse of really like what goes on in the Panther Kingdom other than mad science and fascism mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and vampires? It again plays with those tropes a lot because it's got a lot of stuff that's analogous to like things in Super Mario 64, but they're sort of turned on their head a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Like it's got the big like iron box guys with eyes and mouths and, and funny accents who are very evocative of like the thwomps as they appear in super Mario 64, the except big blue these swamps. Yeah. yeah. The big blue thwomps, except these are like actual people. They have personalities and they're, they're either, you know, pissed at you or, or you're going, Oh, Hey, Frankie sent me and they let you through <laughs> sort of thing. Ba- like they're, ba- they're yeah, actual... basically like all rare and platonic characters. They they have like these very like mundane lives outside of the context of them being absurd video game constructs. Yeah, and like so this is a farm. I'm not sure what the farm is for. You you speculate in the notes that it, it was maybe a cheese farm because you got that little penned off area with the cheese, but you'll notice that like the the area around that penned off bit is a quarry of chi- a quarry. Yeah, uh, speaking of words I can't pronounce properly, a quarry that it looks like the ch- the cheese bits have been mined out of. And this is supported by that that cutting room floor scenario map where there was originally a back half to this area where you'd have to go up through the cheese mountain and have a confrontation with the cheese king and and like mine out the cheese that you were going to bring down. The the way I understand this is they they might be like obtaining the cheese through whatever means, but the cheese is basically it, it's anthropomorphic cheese, cheese with googly eyes. So the cheese is essentially livestock. Yeah. So in in this weird world where you have googly eyes attached to things and granite life, assuming we're we're gonna attach ukulele logic to this, then the the cheese is essentially the cattle. So they're like che- they're at some point they become cheese wranglers and they feed them hay, which also has googly um, eyes. Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking the 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 barn might be for the hay because it's in there, and just the fact that like this isn't the only DKU location with googly eyed hay. We also see it in uh, Diddy Kong Racing in uh, Windmill Plains, where you've got a bunch of windmills and googly-eyed hay bar- bales that are watching you fly by during your race, yeah. uh, sort of grazing out in the pastures, which is another reason I think that, like, Timbers Island is situated at least nearby. <laughs> so, if not, uh, uh, Yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely nearby. They're trading partners, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I think it's a cheese farm. That that's going to be my. Um, hmm, maybe they my feed the cheese to the hay bales, or or so you do you think it's a hay farm that they feed cheese to the yeah, hay, and then yeah. the hay is their export, and they export it to Timbers Island. Yeah, that's what I'm okay. guessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever the case, it doesn't really fucking matter because yeah. uh, the the cheese. Uh, is, is there, so there's, there's a Marvin, the mouse is, yep. is re- one of the first characters you encounter in this game. And basically Marvin is a glutton for cheese and, and Marvin is, uh, I guess a bit of a problem for the farm in that he's kind of like the, the wolf or coyote preying on the cheese, the mm-hmm. livestock. Yeah. And Conquer is kind of has to deal with Marvin if he's allowed to progress uh, through this path. Yeah, and... one of one of the big not thwomps is scared of Marvin and is sort of uh, 
hiding out on another one's back and he's like hey if you take care of marvin for me i'll i'll help you out just go up to the the cheese ranch area and say i sent you and they'll let you in (laughs) sort of thing yeah so how do you deal with marvin then uh, you you go up a a tricky little path that is being thwomped upon, and <laughs> you have to uh, frying pan some of the cheese in the cattle area because it screams and runs away from you on sight. And then you have to grab your downed cheese and bring it back through the thwompy area while it's screaming and pleading for its life, and feed it to Marvin. And you have to do this multiple times until Marvin has accumulated enough gas that he explodes because uh, rodents are actually lactose intolerant and cheese will kill them. <laughs> um, oh, see, I didn't know that little bit. This, yeah. I didn't know uh, as someone actual... As someone who used to keep uh, pet rats and mice, yeah, you don't actually let them have cheese. You bait the traps with cheese because even if they get the cheese out of the traps, it's going to end badly for them. Oh, wow. Um, all right, well, um, as someone who's also partially lactose intolerant... Oh, yeah, same I, here. I, I feel like I, I have newfound kinship with my rodent friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's funny, because I just realized that there are two characters in this game that the whole like way of getting rid of them is just let them be a glutton, and it takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. You say take care of itself, it, it it incapacitates him at most, because yes, he explodes in a bloody mess, um, but it doesn't actually kill him? Doesn't kill him, he comes back at the very end of the game, stitched together. And so, even even his parts are still just kind of sitting there blinking at you. So Yeah, so even though Conker's Bad Fur Day can be heartless in parts... They didn't have it in them to completely off Marvin the Mouse. He, yeah. He, he was taken into a surgery and got better somewhere <laughs> along the way. Maybe this um, was another one of the professor's experiments into immortality or something. No, I, I just think that for all of its <laughs> faults, the Panther King has really good health care. Uh, yeah, fair. Better than ours, at least. Yeah. It, 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 might, be, it might be a terrible aloof monarchy being undermined by fascist teddy bears but you know it's, maybe it's, it's maybe great... it's actually like the uk where the monarchy is just sort of there and they don't run things anymore i mean yeah i, I guess yeah. so i guess yeah um but yeah yeah so then you're able to progress into the actual barn where you meet the titular barn boys that mm-hmm. the chapter is named after And the barn boys are three, like, farm tools slash instruments that you might find lying around a barn. Mm -hmm. And they are Frankie the Pitchfork, uh, Ron the Paint Can, Mm -hmm. uh, who's full of paint, by the way, and Reg the Paint Brush. Yep. And Ron and Reg are a bit of a pair, obviously, and they gang up and bully poor Frankie, who Frankie has the voice of a rambling hick. Uh, he he sounds like what I would imagine Redneck Kong would sound like had we actually got <laughs> Redneck Kong into oh, the god. canon. Oh god. Oh uh, god. Frankie, the golly gone sarnet, derp, 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 derp. That was surprisingly accurate. Yeah, I know. Well, you know. <laughs> Grew up around it all my life. So, mm. uh, Frankie is basically being bullied by Ron and Reg into killing himself because this game gets dark fast. Yeah, and it does. so Frank, like, it's, it's funny, like, looking back at this 20 years later because I'm like, well, that probably wouldn't fly today because we're a lot yeah. more sensitive about these issues. We're a lot more sensitive about these mm-hmm. issues. Wouldn't use that term anymore. Yeah. Uh, all I'll say to that, because it, it comes up a couple of times, especially here in the daytime portions, you know, humor evolves over time and mm-hmm. our perspectives on things evolve over time. Even like the most progressive people 20 years ago went, might not have a problem with some of this stuff in this game. Yeah. We, we change our thinking over time and 
I, I, I think that's fine. That, that is human progress. We are here yeah. on this planet to evolve uh, spiritually, mentally, to get better, to become better people. So, you know, it is what it is. I'm, even, I, I, even Chris Sieber had a bit of a, oh, God, no, reaction when asked if he would make the, the same game today. Sure. Sort yeah. of thing. It, like, I, I don't. Uh, my fear is that people will hold it against the creators from from their perspective of today versus i mean most of most of the things in the game are mild at best like oh yeah we wouldn't do that today because clearly we think in different terms today we we've, we've gotten we better so mm -hmm. yeah but but he is bullied into killing himself and the joke being that he has a pitchfork and when he goes to hang himself from the rafters well he doesn't have a neck so he just hangs there because he, yeah. he is a stick of wood and uh, so i mean that's clever uh so <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh so frankie just hangs there for a bit yep you like, leave you him come hanging. back to that you come back to that. Um, that that just all set up, because because there's this this whole other bit. Um, because you have to get up into the rafters to basically get them down. And this is where I struggle with the chronology here. Um, yeah, the you, bit with the sunflower. Okay, so you you can actually approach this in in a, a couple different ways. Because you you can actually get up into the rafters immediately and get yeah. um get Frankie down and do the initial assault on the hay bales, which then releases the the what we do not yet know is the hay bot. Um uh because Frankie's run off because Conkers saved him and Ron and Reg are still being little shits and Frankie decides he doesn't need them anymore. And it turns out that Frankie was the only one keeping the big murderous hay bale at bay. And they're like, Oh shit. Um, but you can't actually do anything about the hay bot until after you've done the sunflower portion <laughs> of the level. So let's talk so, about the sunflower. Yeah. Um, I just like to point out that, um, Again, referring to the cutting room floor, uh, internally, there is a list of all of the little tasks in the game that are uh, in a levels list. So they would be the levels in the worlds. And the sunflower is referred to as babe in those lists. <laughs> so, um, every other NPC is referred to as by name. So I think it would be disingenuous to assume that she is not also being referred to by name. In these level Babe. lists. Uh, yeah, so she is a voluptuous, uh, well-endowed, um... You got stamens busty. like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a, a sunflower with big breast, And... Yep. Of the same anthropomorphic sunflower species that we saw on the Pocket Tales box art and in the, the starting area of this game... Uh, only she's got big breast, and yep. the King B, Mister King B, um, he he he's been kicked out, kicked out of the hive because he's been lusting after the sunflower, yeah. wanting to pollinate her. Yeah, we should wink, we should wink. mention the reason the hive was stolen back in Windy is because the king is not around. And the king is not around is because he's being a bum over here trying to figure out how to get this sunflower in bed. Not even in bed. He just does his business because the sunflower is just in the ground. So yeah, just public fornication, essentially. Um, but yeah, he he he's he he can't get to the sunflower because she's uh she she needs to be tickled. I I she she's all like curled up, sort of uh, uh, accepting no visitors. And when Conquer goes <laughs> over to talk to her on the king's behalf, she kind of tells him to go away, Tihi, because uh, she's very very ticklish. And his tail, uh, even being in the vicinity, is a bit too much for her. 
And it just so happens that the the Barn Boys chapter area is populated by groups of tickling bees. They're pacifists. They don't sting anybody. They tickle them. So you have to kind of go explore the entire area to grab a bunch of different groups of these bees and get them to follow you back to the sunflower, who will then open up, uh, allowing <laughs> the whoa, king whoa. access. Let's, let's, this, the, let, let me clarify what you mean when you say open up. She'll move. She'll move her arms. Her. her yeah. Uh, she'll. Leaves, her... She'll unfurl. Shall unfurl, we say? Unfurl. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't want people to get more yeah. uh, obscene imagery in their head than what's actually portrayed in the game. Yeah. This was still considered like it's relatively tame by modern standards, but it's still kind of out there to the point that the, the guide chooses to censor these screenshots. So <laughs> I mean, the joke is that it's a bee pollinating a flat. Like it. It's, yeah. Yeah. It, it's just playing like fast and loose with, innuendo and terminology and it, the it birds does the whole and the bees and, them yeah. them making noises while you get the camera shot of conquer looking on and incredibly kind of oh my god looks on his face um and then very satisfied looks on his face like eventually conquer just goes full peeping tom perv and he's like yeah all right um and and we're left to infer the imagery in our heads like what's actually going on here and then after after the king is done and satisfied and fucks off the the sunflower allows you to use her her assets as a platform to bounce up to a higher area to grab another bundle of cash right it, it's, it's all in service of this very crude joke um but yeah it, it is what it is um I, I'm just thinking how many bees exist in the DKU. While we're describing this, I'm just like, oh my god, there are the tickling bees. There's, of course, the you know, the royal family here in this game. That mm-hmm. zingers, uh, the bees from Tropical Freeze, the the, the buzzes, buzzes, the the bees from uh, the bee transformation, oh, and Lord. the zubas, and then uh, of course, ukulele and impossible yeah, layer. Yeah. The Royal Battalion and King uh, uh, Capital B himself and so many bees. bees, so many bees. Yeah. Anyway, yes, yeah, so, and and there's money up there, right? There, yeah. There is we we hey should ho. mention that the main collectible of the game is wads of cash. Again, because because of the like just very freewheeling style of the game, there was not really a good time to mention this until now. <laughs> <laughs> is that the main quote unquote collectible because it really serves very little purpose other than yeah it's it's a very soft gate you're only gated like two maybe three times on it on having specific amounts of cash but the amounts of cash you need for those gates are like you could maybe not pick up one of these and you'd still yeah. have enough cash. You really have to get pretty much all of it to progress. It's not really a like, well, if you've gotten 70% of it, you can move on like you can in like Banjo or Mario. It's yeah, you you pretty much pick these up as you go. You're railroaded into most of them. Some of them, yeah, you can leave behind. Like you could do this sunflower thing and then not bounce up there and get it. But like why would you not do that? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the the money, the the official term for it is feho, but it's just it's just uh, wads of cash with googly eyes, googly eyes and cigars. You want some of this green stuff? Yeah, it's fucking weird. Like when when you look at the currency in the DKU, you got banana coins, bear coins, various forms of treasure. And then here in the Panther Kingdom, you have American-style dollars smoking mm-hmm. cigars. Yep. Uh, everybody else is on, like, the coins. like, And, and here they've got bills. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. So... So from, from, from this point, you can, you, you know, you... You can do the full sequence with... Uh, 
fr- from uh, roasting the bats to yeah. Once uh, you get up into the, the rafters, robot. there's a nice little gag where some bats are are hanging out in the rafters, and one of them's like, "Hey, hey, who's that?" And the other one's like, "I can't fucking see. I'm blind. I'm a bat." Um, and um, do you actually roast them here? Or do you just throw knives at them? Don't remember. I I get because. The bats, I I forget usually yeah. that there are bats in the barn. Mm-hmm. I associate the bats with uh, spooky. Yeah, they're so inconsequential here. Like I literally only think they're here so that them showing up later in Bats Tower can be the follow up pun. You know? Yeah. Um. So there's some bats. They make a pun. They don't really impede you at all. You get over to the rafter where you can contact Sensitive Pad to throw some knives at Frankie's noose to let him down. And then he is eternally grateful to you, much to, to Conker's annoyance, and helps you take out these uh, wandering googly-eyed barrels of hay. And then you kind of have to fight the big, tough barrel of hay who's got like a James Bond villain voice. Ah, oh, my nemesis has arrived sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Only once you defeat him, you like the floor cracks and you fall into the basement and you kind of assume he's dead, but he gets back up and now it's a Terminator pastiche. (laughs) Why? Why is there a killer robot cyborg in a hay bale? Why is why is there a haybot in general? We discussed this again on the Kong Parison on the First World Bosses mm-hmm. episode. Uh, I was on that episode, and you know my whole thing with the haybot is I think I always inferred that he was this like weirdly advanced security system for the barn. Yeah, but, I'd I'd buy it, but also um, he views Frankie as his nemesis. Because he, he associate he identifies as hay, and so yeah. a pitchfork would be his nemesis. But yeah, th- this is probably the highlight for me before the great mighty poo of the game. Yeah, this, this whole boss fight, jumping on Frankie. Um, I, it's it's nice to see Conquer collaborating with one of the mm-hmm. weirdos in this world. Yeah, it's a nice culmination of sort of all of the bits and bops you've learned up to this point kind of comes together in this boss fight the context sensitive actions the the using different bits to your advantage and and making like quickly learning new control schemes as you hop on a vehicle because that's what frankie is in this context um and and it's a nice cool boss fight um I should mention that the music in this game is is fucking amazing. <laughs> like yeah. I this has one of the better DKU soundtracks up to this point. <laughs> um Robin Beanland did a stupendous job with this soundtrack and and here is no different. You know, really I, I, really sets the mood. I'm sure I'll be talking more about Robin Beeland's soundtrack throughout <laughs> uh the the Spotlight series cuz I feel like I've talked more about his contributions to the writing on this episode, but Robin Beanland, you know, I think for a lot of rare fans, especially like rare fans of this era, Beanland is weirdly overlooked. Um, yeah. People really gravitate to David Wise and Grant Kirkhope, and for obvious reasons. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. amazing composers as well. They've, they've got very identifiable styles though, uh, or at least they have been sort of, identified as like people gravitate towards um what what's seen as their styles they, they're they're both capable in their own right of deviating from said styles and they have even at rare but you know david wise has kind of got that new agey sort of synthy um atmospheric sound kirkhope has kind of got that very upbeat um, sort of cartoony driving um, sort of way about his music 
And Beanland is harder to peg down, as we've said on the conversation before, Beanland is more of a musical chameleon. And he, I think because of that, a lot of fans don't, like, they'll, they'll, they'll like his music, but they won't really, like, talk about him as much. Because it's it's not so much like you hear a song and you're like, that's Robin Beanland. Uh, you can kind of hear it in places, like especially with Sea of Thieves. There are some Sea of Thieves songs uh, in the last three years where you're like, that kind of sounds like Conquer. But it's rare that you really can can kind of peg Beanland down in, in that way that you can a Wise and a Kirkhope. So I think yeah. it's kind of overlooked. But I think it also speaks to why he's head of music at Rare now. Uh, because he's kind of capable of just going all over the place. That's true. Yeah, I do. There are some bits of the of Sea of Thieves that recognizably, to me at least, sound like parts of the Conquer soundtrack. And yeah, it's yeah. probably because of him. Um, especially the uh the the ghost ship battles. Really, uh, they're they're invocative of spooky and and. I was actually thinking the Merchant Alliance jingle that plays when you get near their stand sounds like the introduction to the game. Just the harpsichord. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I wonder if it's the same chords leading into a different medley. Um, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, he does an amazing job on this soundtrack. Yeah. But yeah, yeah cool absolutely. boss fight. You're you're right. Yeah. It is a highlight. And and it really makes me like the character of Frankie more than I I thought I like the, when when I think back to Bad Fur Day, Frankie is not a character that really registered with me at first. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah, Frankie's a solid character and mm-hmm. I like that he and Conker had a little bit of a moment. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Yeah, and this this harkens back to like Conquer not being as bad of a person as people make him out to be. Because like, there's nothing really in it for Conquer when Conquer helps out Frankie. Like, yeah. he doesn't ask for any money. He's not expecting any money out of this. He just helps out Frankie. <laughs> um, I I feel like Conquer is deep down. Deep down, Conker is a good person. Yeah. But he's pulled in all the wrong directions. And he, at this point, he, he has a view of himself where maybe he doesn't want to be the hero. He 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 wa- he, he kind of wants to be um, more of a hard-edged case than he actually is. Mm-hmm. And... and I where where like Conker like helps out the broken Frankie and tries to reassure him, like I'm like oh wow like there's a good guy under there and even like, even all the sort of jokey things he says when he picks up the bundles of cash like oh man I'm gonna go have a round with the lads tonight or like oh man I'm gonna be able to pay off my mortgage and it's like yeah you laugh a little bit but if you think about all of them it's like. Oh yeah, he's going to pay off his mortgage or he's going to be able to go out and spend some time with his friends or something. Um mm-hmm. so it's not like money for money's sake. He's actually going to be using it for kind of good reasons. <laughs> yeah. I I think people focus me included focus on the few irredeemable things conquered yeah, in the game. Yeah, he he does do some just blatantly bad shit in this game, but I Again, I think that's just sort of the humor of the day stuff rather than being intentionally a bad person. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, it, it's hard to peg him down. Like, is he a sociopath? Well, clearly not, but I I think yeah. he's just yeah, he he's he, the devil on his shoulder is a little bit too loud at times. Mm, yeah. Uh, but th- then, you know, the, the Haybot, the defeat of the Haybot, you're not done because then yeah. you've got this whole sequence with the dangling, like, uh, yeah. severed wires and There's, like, it's yeah. flooding and, oh no, you're going to be electrocuted. Mm-hmm. Over, over the course of this boss fight, you've knocked free some electrical wires and flooded the area and it's continuing to flood and you need to 
sort of get up on these platforms that have some context sensitive pads that allow you to knife throw so that you can cut down these dangling electrical wires uh, at various heights as the water continues to rise in the room, allowing you to eventually get back up to uh, ground level. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is one of the first really, like in, in the context of later portions of the game, it's not difficult at all, but I think it's the first major major bit that players are going to have to do a couple times before they get it right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, this also reminds me of an episode of Perfect Strangers. Yeah? Uh, it was the very first time in my young life that I had ever s- seen a show pull the To Be Continued card. Ooh. Where uh, Balky and Larry were stuck in their apartment building's basement, and it was flooding with water. And mm. it was going to rise up to the electrical box. And mm. and they were like, oh, my God, we're getting electrocuted. And it said, to be continued. And I was like, <gasps> to be continued? What does that mean? <laughs> so that, that was where I learned about cliffhangers. Ooh. So thank you, perfect strangers. Uh, anyway, after that, then you got the diving board sequence that kind of like, yeah, and you go up to the, the water tower, is it? And then yeah, you have to you, jump down into the, the, so exiting from this, uh, boss fight area kind of spits you out behind and above the barn in an area that you could get to before, but it was kind of out of the way. And there's a, a ladder that just goes up and up and up and up and up. And now that you've defeated the Haybot, there's some wasps flying around that you kind of have to avoid their flight patterns as you go up. And you eventually get way up there and there's a diving board into sort of the, the water reservoir up above mm. the barn, the the rain uh, catch. And you jump off and do a uh, context-sensitive uh, anvil transformation and pound the switch, draining all the water and opening up a uh, a little passage uh, elsewhere in the area that has some more money in it. Overall, I liked Barn Boys. Uh, I think it's the most solid chapter. Yeah, um, I was about to say, it's a solid kind of first real world. Like, Hungover was an, a, a tutorial area. Windy is very much a hub level that doesn't have, like like a co an overarching theme and you come back to it a lot and do things in between chapters. This is the first real like world in the game. And it's, it's yeah, it's really solid. Um, yeah. I, I, th- I think as far as like structure goes, there's a lot of nice give and take and set up of, of all the little different elements and it, it, it pays off with a satisfying boss fight. And then another like, kind of spectacle and the the high dive and Mm -hmm. you got memorable characters you got some uh naughty jokes yep and it's basically kind of the best of conquerors bad fur day uh in this kind of first world setting uh then it goes immediately downhill into the worst (laughs) bit of the game or at least our our, both of our uh least favorite well it goes uphill first uh because you have to return to windy and do um some stuff in the poo shed which is now open because it's past 10 oh the poo yes uh so it's past 10 and the shed is open and you go in and there's a receptionist beetle he's like oh you you want a ball of shit well you gotta you gotta go up and and get it rolling and then i'll just i'll put the balls out for you and conquer's like what i uh, okay and so you uh, dive into the reservoir and then make your way up the, uh, what would you even call this? You're, you're climbing up a structure that is a like poo drainage thing um, that has a big uh, hole in the bottom that all the poo drains into. And in in some of those early design docs, uh, diving down into that at the end of this segment would be how you get into the Great Mighty Pooh area. (laughs) Um, But that's now a different section. So you get to the top, and there's a little cow grazing area. 
And you have to get the cows to go poo in the grate to get the the poo rolling downhill, as it were. And there is... I wouldn't call this a boss fight, but it is definitely a thing you have to do. You know, this is this is one of those set pieces that people remember, where you have to sort of ole and um, dodge a charging bull who is incensed because Conqueror is red. Which um, isn't actually a thing, but we'll just allow it. And while you're doing that, there are these uh, delicate... Oh look, I'm I'm going to go graze on some grass and and have some of this drink, uh, cows, and the drink in question being a uh, reservoir of prune, prune juice that you've started up. Right. So basically, w- what we're inferring here is the dung beetles, yeah, have these cows that they feed prune juice to get them to shit massive quantities. So then they can have their their balls of poo. One wonders if we've mucked this up by killing all the cows to get them in the way, but it doesn't seem to affect the uh, stock of poo balls that they can provide for you. So who knows? Yes, because you have to get the get the uh, the, the 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 cows once. Get gored. Yeah, once yes. once each cow's done its business, you get it out of the way by goring it with the bull. Right. I, again, just wanton murder for murder's sake. Uh, but the, what most people remember is the, the visual of the cows over the grate having violent diarrhea mm. and commenting on it, which you always want to do when experiencing diarrhea, yeah. is have a running commentary on what is happening to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is where I learned the term "the screaming shits." So thank you. <laughs> that is the the Robin phrase Newman. that sticks in one's mind, certainly. Oh yes, yes. Um, uh, so. And yeah, once once you've completed this little sequence, this game is a big stickler for doing things in sets of three. So once you've you've gored the third cow and the the bull uh, laments that he's such a fat bastard and falls through the grate himself. Uh, you dive down after him and uh, exit the the poo shed, where uh, the dung beetles will now uh, start uh, rolling out balls of poo for you to roll around like a snowball that gets ever increasingly larger. Because we did we mention that this little area of windy is literally a mountain of poo. I think I think you you kind of hinted at it yeah yeah but, yeah that hence the the poo smell from the path and it, it's just basically because the dung beetles had made this a home and they just needed poo because they are dung beetles even, yeah. I think they even comment on they don't even know why they do what they do yeah rolling the balls they just do it and um so there's there's a couple you you this this poo mountain is sort of the the mechanic for which you uh, interact with to open up the rest of the daytime chapters in the game. <laughs> um, yes, rolling a ball of poo off to the side and pushing it over the edge will cause it to fall on a uh, patrolling goblin guard, uh, allowing you to slip past him and hit a switch, which will cause a whirlpool to start up. Uh, getting rid of all of the sort of uh, aquatic mine goblin guards, allowing you to get into the entrance to the Bat's Tower chapter. All right. Yep. Um, I'm going to be up front. This chapter fucking sucks. It's the worst chapter in the game. Um, Heil didn't even remember it existed. It's just... I bad if it's not bad mechanically it's bad content wise and i remembered it existed i couldn't remember i had to look up and see if it came uh before or after the soprano chapter because i was like it it takes place somewhere after a barn boys it's very forgettable and the longest portion of it is if you've only played live and reloaded is a non issue because they, they fixed the bit that makes it frustrating. Um, the swimming bit. Yeah. Uh, so, so the main framing conceit of this entire chapter is you've got a bunch of 
prim and prissy, uh, uh, snobby lady catfishes who are, are treating Conker like the help and are offering him a pittance to go um, do something about the dogfish that is guarding the uh, vault that they are keeping their money in. Right, I mean, th- this is just where we're at. We have catfish, right? So let's introduce dogfish. Sure. I'd just like to point out that dogfish are a thing and they're a type of shark. Um, I-, I know, I know, but the way it's portrayed <laughs> yeah, in-game, yeah. it's it's just a literal... It's, yeah, it's very much the dog from, like, Tom and Jerry cartoons, except on a fish yeah. body. Um, <laughs> Again, this is where the conquer being uh, inspired and influenced by Western animation really, yeah. uh, and really like, comes into play. Yeah, and like... So you you swim down the way, you avoid the dog shark, um, and you swim down into the section and come out in the titular bat's tower. Um, this section's also bad, and it's kind of completely divorced from the whole catfish thing. And my theory, given the structure of it, is that this was originally going to be the windmill. Oh, really? Because, well, so the setup is you've got some some cogs on a wall and there's some missing cogs powering this mechanism. And there is a mill that you have to run around and spin in the middle of it after you've gotten these cogs back. And then climb your way up this tower that now has this uh, mill machinery operating because the cogs are in place to get to the top of the tower and flip this switch which reigns in the dogfish outside, allowing the catfish to get past him and for you to get to the vault. Um, and just the whole setup of it, it's like you're, it's the inside of a mill. It's very reminiscent of the inside of the windmill you see in 12 Tales footage where Conker had to run around on the plate to operate the mill to get it spinning. Um, I, I think this was going to be the inside of the windmill and it got moved over here for some reason. What what do you think Bat's Tower is though in the context of the game it's itself what what's established what is it in the political <clears throat> realm of the Panther Kingdom That's a good question because like who are the goblins working for I I've tried to rationalize this as maybe the the goblins slash uh, imps the the armored fellas uh like maybe they also work for the Panther yeah, King. Yeah, because like the like... the weasels are working for the Panther King and or is a professor. Um and the goblins the goblins are again only really in like the first half of the game. Yeah. Um there there are some uh goblin NPCs in its war, but they're not bad guys. No, they're you have to kill them. Yeah. But they're they they just they, they just happen to have they, TNT yeah. barrels strapped to their backs. And like the goblins are otherwise just sort of patrolling around and don't actively attack you. They hurt you if you try to attack them, but they don't get in your face otherwise. It's it's hard to say. And like the according to the the guide and other supplemental material those monks are also goblins so like they're just another race here but again they kind of disappear after the first half of the game so yeah i i can't tell if this like bat's tower is this like older piece of architecture that the goblins have taken over um like maybe it like dates back to the milk wars but yeah i they've don't got know their own thing going or if they're in directs or if they're like more of a local police force or i i i don't know yeah i don't know either way uh this tower is populated by bats and cogs um the the cogs are um they're problematic uh, yeah, when when I when I mentioned earlier that some of the stuff you know that we're going to talk about doesn't hold up twenty years later, I was thinking about the cogs. Yeah, uh, this this entire section of the chapter is either uh, rape jokes, rape jokes, gay jokes, or gay rape jokes. Um, a little bit of a gay panic too. Uh, yeah, just like yeah, that kind of underlines it all. Yeah. Um, Carl 
uh, is is the the kind of gruff, um, chauvinist um, version of the cog, but then you flip him over and he's got another personality, uh, and and it's Quentin who is, you know, uh, stereotypical flamboyant gay man. Yes. Uh, just... Um, and when I mentioned that some cogs were missing from the mechanism, it's because all the women ran away from Carl. Yes. And uh, he needs you to bring them back. And it's it's heavily implied that they do not want to be there. And Carl's getting some some sexual gratification out of them being hooked into this mechanism. Well, the the female uh, cogs are also have the big. Um kind of blow up doll lips yeah um, sex doll lips yeah so there you know you 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 can gather what the implication is and th- then of course uh carl gets his comeuppance uh by getting yeah it, it, it's very much in tune with the prison rape jokes one might see when yeah uh, a, a a figure gets uh thrown into jail like people's to this day you'll see people make oh you're gonna get raped in prison ha, yeah ha, ha. in in the course of you getting to the top of the tower and flipping the mechanism that reigns in the dogfish the the lady cogs get free and beat up carl and uh affix him to a mr big cog another cog who has hitherto been silent, um, which Carl is horrified by, but Quentin is, oh, he's just delighted and doesn't know what Carl's problem is. And sure, on the surface level, you could maybe squint your eyes and disregard all of the clear implications here by saying, well, they're just cogs up on poles, part of a mechanism. But given that they are anthropomorphic and given the clear implication of what's happening what the joke is supposed to be. Uh, it is it, it is honestly the most problematic part of the game that yeah. you, you, you really, like, you're kind of just like, oh, wow, oh, God. And then I Quentin sort of this game. shoes you away. He's like, oh, I think your problem outside's been taken care of and you should leave now so I can enjoy myself sort of thing. And it's just yes. the whole section is so divorced thematically from what's going on outside with the catfish and stuff like they don't even quentin doesn't even mention it specifically he just says like whatever your problem was outside has probably been taken care of now um which is another reason i think that they was sort of just kind of cut and pasted from a different area of the game Mm -hmm. um but yeah you leave the dogfish has been reined in the the catfish uh, enter in the combination, such as it is, to get into the vault, um, and you get in to retrieve their money, but the money doesn't trust you, so it dives into the um, drainage system in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, uh, this is where the content is no longer problematic, but the mechanics of the content fucking sucks. Um, it's problematic in a whole new way where you still want to die experiencing uh, it. This section took me reasons. three days because I kept getting really, really frustrated with it and putting the game down. And I trying... don't think it took me that long, but it definitely... Uh, props to, to, I think it was Cameron pointing out that the pipes you need to go through next have uh, co- f- colored flashing lights on them to signify mm-hmm. that that's where you should go. Before our, uh, that was pointed out to me, I was just getting lost down there. Um, that's that's not even the frustrating part. The frustrating part is that Conker starts drowning like immediately underwater, and you have he, to go through very lengthy swimming periods making it to the next little like air bubble supply, and or else you just die. Like once once you run out of air which isn't a visual meter. You just get like a mugshot of Conker holding his breath and he gets gradually like more distressed. So it's not like... I do love that meter though because yeah, it's, it's so it's wonderfully animated. Except like 
I had to see it so many times. <laughs> and like, um, one of the reasons a lot of people don't remember this bit is because in live and reloaded, they like tripled conquers lung capacity. So he just doesn't start drowning immediately. And so this, this whole section is trivial. Well, I mean, it, it's, Conker remembers having a greater lung capacity. Yeah, uh, yeah. When he reflects back on the events uh, in 2005. But, <laughs> yes. And it's like, like, the the bit after this is fine and probably, like, the only standout section of this entire chapter. But this this actual swimming through multiple sets of underwater piping that look exactly the same that have enemies swimming through them that will hurt you uh and also make you waste some of your air meter as you wait to get out of the being hurt underwater animation and just yeah it was very very frustrating um uh, once you get through this section, though, you come out in the boiler room, which, again, is one of those set pieces of the game that people actually remember, and one we've alluded to before, <laughs> um, because this is the bit where Conker gets drunk and starts peeing on fire imps. And someone at Nintendo loved this. We'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is also a nice little uh, nod to Twelve Tales and Pocket Tales because it's got the one piece of music that yeah. was uh, uh, in both uh, that's been repurposed for this. Uh, just conquer, which now pretty much maybe yeah, tells yeah. you what they think of that. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it's conquer urinating on fire imps. And, you, you know, know, I love that, you know, Jeff, uh, our, Jeff Onan, our, our fellow DK Vine staffer and uh, friend as well. He is a friend. Uh, he says that Conker will never get into Smash Brothers because he is a squirrel that pisses on people. And I think that that's too dismissive at times, but... Yeah. Conquer pissing on people definitely is an aspect of him that came back after this game. It, and and I love that here he's pissing on antagonists, but in Big Reunion, he has to piss on a friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last time this happened, I wasn't even on fire. Um, <laughs> Big Reunion is funnier than people give it credit for. Oh, it super is. Um, yeah, you have to, there's, there's a bunch of little fire imps being crewed and you have to get tanked and, uh, in the words of a TV show, I like, we'll drink the beer and use our bodies as fire engines. Um, and that's what Conquer does. And once you have extinguished enough of the little fire imps, two of them will scurry into the boiler in the center and boot it up like a mech, except it is also prescient and very posh and has big bowls of brass. Mm -hmm. um, and a boss fight ensues. And um, doesn't this guy look like the boiler in Isometric Palace? Uh, Bernie? Yeah, he's got like the same face. Yeah, Do boilers maybe. just all look the same in the DKU? Or in the UK, maybe. Yeah, uh, fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, a, a boss fight ensues where you have to, um, drain some, some stuff on top of the boiler as he runs around and tries to stomp you and then, uh, go up and, uh, clap his, his big brass what's it's with some bricks and, uh, he'll, he'll scream out in a high pitched voice multiple times as you go through this boss fight. And then you uh, get to roll them around later as a puzzle-solving mechanic after the boss fight. Yep, just more of, of bad for days humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know it's. Um, I'm I'm disparaging a little bit. It is a fun boss fight. the The boss fights are pretty solid in this game, actually. <laughs> they are. The they are part. for a game that's not remembered much for its boss fights. It's got some solid boss fights. Yeah, and. I think that's something that, you know, I 
I said even Donkey Kong 64, I think, had solid boss fights. Um, as disparaging I am towards that game, but it, mm-hmm. it is something that, uh, DK64, Banjo Tooie, and Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, I think, all had some of the more fun boss fights on the N64. Yeah, they were pretty, pretty good. Um, after this, you, you go down one last hatch and eventually get, you get spit out back in the entrance to the vault chamber where the money has finally stopped running from you. And allows you to take it out. Um, but it turns out to only be $10. And the cats were going to give you a 10% cut. Um, mm. Conqueror says he's going to keep all of it. And just kind of stands by. As the dogfish finally escapes its leash. And starts viciously tearing the catfish apart while Jaws music plays. Yep. And this is not off screen. They do a cutscene every single time he catches a catfish while you are swimming back to the entrance to the chapter. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, to sum this all up, Conquer did all of this, the most miserable part of the game, for $10. Um, as the dogfish runs out of catfish and chases you, they do a pastiche of a, the dock scene in the 1998 TriStar Godzilla film, uh, with classic the, reference. I got it, but I own four copies know, of that I, movie. I, so I know, but like, even like, even four years after that, roughly, was that like a movie you were like, yeah, you know what we should homage? The American Godzilla. Well, okay, with to be Matthew fair, Broderick. that was the one scene they played in trailers and previews a lot. Um, so that was you probably own- on on television a decent amount, the, that the, particular the scene. O- the only two things I remember from, from that movie, the promotions from that movie were... The tagline "size does matter" because that's the <laughs> first time I ever heard that reference to penises, and to the Taco Bell tie-in with the yep. Chihuahua. I think I'm going to need a bigger box. Um. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Here, lizard, lizard, lizard. Here, I lizard, you lizard, said. lizard. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think that was what finally resulted in the lawsuit, which lost them the rights to use that little Chihuahua. <laughs> really. Uh, yeah, they were using that character without permission, turns out. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, they, they'd commissioned it for an advertising campaign, but uh, didn't actually own the character and kept using it anyway. And I think it was the Godzilla promos that eventually resulted in the uh, creator finally having a big enough thing to point at to go, this is really costing me some money, them using this without permission. Uh, but yeah, you you get up on the dock and the dogfish chews through it and slams himself into the wall. And you can then use him as a platform to get up to a little loft where there are three bundles of cash. So you actually net yourself like 310. Wait, no, there was some money in the tower as well. So I think you make out of this chapter all told with like 410 more dollars in your belt or something Still not like worth that. It. Yeah, not really. But you know, I I will say this is this is like the only true low point. Like looking at what's ahead after this, uh, yeah, it's like there's... memorable sequence after memorable sequence. The humor like isn't even like problematic in the same. Yeah, like, the, it's this truly is truly the only thing that doesn't hold up in the harsh mm-hmm. light of twenty twenty one is the whole cog bit. Um, you, you could say, like, yeah, the professor has uh, a troublesome name. It has a slur in it. We can't say the full thing. But that is why I'll you know. never be able to speedrun Young Conquer at GDQ. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really just, you know, that, that little cog bit. If, if we could edit that out, I think a lot of Conquer would still hold up today. Yeah, pretty much. Even just changing the context of the cog bit, like changing sure. the dialogue would sure. fix it honestly yeah um, yeah but what what is timeless and classic and will <laughs> never go out of fashion singing operatic poo men yep you you exit 
the uh, the Bats Tower chapter, and you're back next to the Pooh Mountain, and you have to do some more Pooh rolling up the mountain this time instead of off the side of it. And uh, once you get it to the top, uh, you can push a bundle of Pooh in, which falls down through the innards and blows out the boarded up entrance, so you can now get in. And going in, you are treated to a short uh, sort of slasher film pastiche cutscene where a, a uh, dung beetle trying to escape tells you about all how all of his friends were picked off uh, and he when he came out of hiding he found out that they'd boarded up the entrance and he's been trapped in here for weeks and he escapes and a a mysterious voice tells you to bring me some sweet corn. So, what more can be said about this that hasn't already been said or thought by it's, anyone uh... who's played this game or experienced this game? It it is it is probably the most iconic element from this game. Yeah, I believe sure, it's you... billed in the credits as Chucky Pooh's Lament. Uh... Right. So, is his name Chucky Pooh? Uh, officially. I don't know. I think he's referred to as the Great Mighty Pooh in all material. That's what he calls himself in the song. Um, because I know... Like, that might... Uh, that Pooh might be his last name, and his first name's Chucky? I don't know. <laughs> right. Like, uh, I know on DK Vine, we've... we've Since Conqueror's Bad Fur Day came out, because of that uh, credit of, of Chucky Pooh's Lament... The character itself has been classified as Chucky Poo yeah. in in like our databases and everything since then, and I've always kind of hated that name because everybody knows him as the Great Mighty Poo, um, and it's weird whenever we we like eh, Chucky Poo. It's like <laughs> see. like so I've I've started to just call him the Great Mighty Poo, even if Chucky Poo is his official name. It's like yeah. this is what people know him as. This is what the song refers to mm-hmm. him as. Yeah. That iconic song. Uh, sung by Chris Marlowe. Uh, it should be pointed out. Chris Marlowe, who's still at Rare today. Still does some collaborations with Chris Seaver. I think he helped out on Rusty Pup a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, which led some people to erroneously think he had also left Rare and joined Gory Detail, but that is not the case. Um, but yeah. Chris Marlowe said, I'm working, work, worked on Sea of Thieves, and he is also a very uh, affable gentleman. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him when I went to Rare, and he serenaded us, I think, three times with, with the song. Um, <laughs> he, do- he doesn't need much poking and prodding if you ever meet him in real life to bust it out yeah uh, he's, he's more than happy to do so he's busted out on stream a number of times as well you're right he yeah, does, it yeah. doesn't take much to get him going it is weird to see the song being sung by a human man <laughs> rather than uh a, a poo beast yeah uh the the beast of poo mountain as the manual says there, there's a little bit before the fight starts proper where you have the giant hands coming out of the poo pools to slap around for uh, anthropomorphic pieces of sweet corn uh, that you have to toss him. And I believe Live and Reloaded reduces the amount of sweet corn you have to toss in. We have yeah. to go do this at three different pools before the fight starts. And it's a sing-along. There's lyrics um, displayed and a little back and operatic back and forth between uh, the the mighty poo and conquer, and you have to throw uh, bog rolls into his mouth at various points during the fight. It's weird that, like, in the context of a living poo creature, the, a poo creature really enjoys eating sweet corn. Like, I I understand the connection <laughs> in the context, but it's like the the one thing, like something that humans have trouble digesting and it just passes through in a, and remains in our stool. Um, yeah, it's weird that a, 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 an anthropomorphic piece of poop would get any enjoyment out of that. Uh, TV Tropes speculates in its fridge logic section that maybe this is why he's so massive is he's he's continued to ingest pieces of sweet corn that just kind of build onto his body mass i should also point out this is not the only time we see anthropomorphic poo in the dku <laughs> uh Grunny's revenge again second time i've referenced Grunny's revenge in this episode mm. has 
actual poo characters in Spiller's Harbor. They're they're called the the Squits. And yeah, it's it's surprising how bits of Conquer bleed out into other rare properties from Donkey Kong 64 to Grunty's Revenge and so on. I mean, it's a shared universe, and for as much as some creators try to deny that it's a shared universe, by the nature of the way these games were made and the back and forth between the teams and the, the you know, reuse of characters between the different games, they built a pretty damn good shared universe. Mm-hmm. And so you'll have, like, yeah, there's this Beast of Pooh Mountain, but Poo creatures do exist, mm-hmm. like smaller, more gentle poo creatures. Yeah. You have to help out. Uh, so, I mean, weasels and poo creatures pop up elsewhere in the DKU. So. They sure do. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, and once you defeat him, you go to the second room of this chapter, because this is its own chapter. And mm-hmm. it's 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 another annoying swimming section, but it's actually really, really short and air is very generous. And like, yeah, I think I died a lot, but they put a extra life tail right there next to your respawn point. So even though yeah. I think I spent like 15 minutes getting through these these whirling underwater fan blades, it wasn't really frustrating at all. You just kind of go through no. it. And it's done. No, it, it, it's definitely not Bat's Tower Redux. It, yeah. It, it, it feels more manageable. So And, and like, I kind of think of, of Sloprano as just sort of like the boss of Windy. Because I know, like, um, Nightfall after the next chapter is where, like, you get the major tonal and gameplay shift from, like, platformer to third-person shooter. But... Really, this because you have to go through slow slow prano to get to the next chapter. Uga booga. You don't return to Windy after slow prano. Well, you have to return to Windy if you don't have enough money because this is one of those money gates. But if you've collected all your money up to this point, you have more than enough by a couple hundred to to bribe these guards and get through to Uga booga. Mm. But this is the point where the game gets very linear and there's no more really branching paths and you can do things in separate orders and this is where the familiar races start to show up this is where like the weasels and the ogas and and squirrels and whatnot start to show up and this is where barry reappears because going um you get your cutscene, uh you get your your transitional cutscene. um up to this point in the game, you've been getting transitional cutscenes as you enter each new chapter with a little progression of the Panther King and Professor storyline of, of the Professor finding, in quotes, a way to fix this table leg and um, uh, sending out the, the troops to go look for a red squirrel. The transitional cutscene here is the first time we've seen Barry since the intro to the game. And she answers the door, thinking it's Conker finally having come home. And it's one of the rock people from Ugga Booga. And he mm-hmm. clobbers her and drags her out. And so this is where Barry re-enters the story. And, and this is where we kind of eschew the dung beetles and the bees and start getting into the races that show up in multiplayer and uh, will appear for the rest of the game. Yeah, and this is where you really, like, Conquer really starts to intersect with the broader plot. Like, the what what's actually happening yeah. elsewhere in the Panther Kingdom, and the, 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 what the Professor is orchestrating, he starts to get directly roped into that, whether anybody realizes it now or not. Yeah. And... And yeah, like, I, I could see the case to be made, like, maybe we should have, like, kicked off the next episode with Ooga Booga, <laughs> but uh, no, I it think, certainly would make this one shorter. But, I think Nightfall's uh, still a good cutoff point, because that there's a bigger shift there, but this is definitely, like, the the tail end of the daytime stuff. This is sort of the transition. I um, mean, this is also what where you see the sun setting, this is where the, yeah. the tone it starts to take itself a little bit more seriously here yeah um, things feel like they have greater consequence other than conquer being just uh either a dick or meeting dicks yeah 
it, it's um, uh, it's a little is, bit more heavy from here on out. This is where his goals change, actually, because he's he's actually reunited with Barry here, so he's no longer actually trying to get home. <laughs> yes. Um, He's trying to to kind of meet up with Barry now that she is also out here. Um, but Barry is pissed at Conker. Yep, pissed at Conker for being pissed. So, and and so, I'm a little bit foggy on this. I have my ideas, but the the Rock people. Why did they abduct Barry? Um, it is mentioned in the manual that they uh like to procure go-go dancers for their club that is literally it because i thought maybe the weasel mafia had a hand in this the the weasel mafia has a hand in like the club i think in a background Mm -hmm. level um but i don't think they specifically had a hand in kidnapping barry like nefariously or something Okay, because I thought maybe to procure the red squirrel, they got the, the, the girlfriend of the red squirrel and brought her in here to the Weasel Mafia. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, right. All right, well, uh, Ooga Booga or Ugga Bugga, uh, yeah. whatever, uh, it, it is the prehistoric area of yeah. the game. And this is well, really where... It is, like, so... So up to this point, all of the chapters up to this point, Hungover, Windy, uh, Barn Boys, Bats Tower, Sloprano, they all have sort of a mashup of a bunch of stuff from Twelve Tales. You see aspects of like the windmill area and the uh, Wild West area and the catacombs area and just bits and pieces of all of those sort of scattered throughout all of those chapters. Whereas Ooga Booga is very clearly just the dino safari world from 12 tales followed by the roman coliseum <laughs> world from mm-hmm. 12 tales just one after another it's like we we stop mashing up elements from all those other chapters i just mentioned and it's just those two things which is again sort of this shift into the second half of the game where instead of this kind of collage of aspects we are repurposing worlds wholesale at this point so yeah this is also really i feel like where it feels like other dku games again because we've got this very um adventurous kind of genre like um land before time sort of mm. obviously diddy kong racing yeah. and banjo tui both had mm-hmm. like their prehistoric areas and yeah. So and and this is even again note the similarities here we've got a prehistoric area that's populated by this kind of throwback human mm-hmm. uh ancestor like, like subspecies yeah. uh the the Uga Bugas. uh so it, it's it's just yet another tribe like we met in Pterodactyl land except mm. these they they live here yeah and um just another shared aspect of the rare archipelago there you go yeah, yeah. and you know we we could even say yeah the dinosaurs here they're from dinosaur planet and yeah. they they settled here while others settled dino domain while others settled in pterodactyl land yeah. hey uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah uh yeah it's like kind of kind of being able to like knowing the behind the scenes stuff and sort of where the bits of this level came from it's very easy to see the delineation but it it kind of it works as sort of a thing uh on it as a self-contained thing uh when you're playing through it you you start out immediately behind Pooh Mountain you're sort of uh uh shat out as it were um and you come out uh, up on this bluff, and there's two weasel guards, specifically the two that have been attending to the Panther King, and he sent out to procure a red squirrel. And Conker bluffs his way past them, and I can't believe I only just got that joke now, 20 years later, <laughs> while writing up these show notes. The bluff. Honestly, I I'm never dumb. thought about that. I never thought about it in that term until just now, so um, you're not the only one. Conker convinces one of them that he's an elephant while the other one is taking a piss behind a rock. 
um, and bribes them and goes past and then whistles and the money comes back to him. Um, and then you sort of get into, I don't want to call it the hub of, of Ugga Booga, but it's, there's this little area that's in between the dino section and the nightclub section. And it's got like a wall in the middle of it. And, and mm-hmm. one, one half is populated by the rock guys and one half is populated by the little Uggas. And you have to do some puzzle solving by like rolling one of the rock guys over to squash some Uggas who are guarding the way so you can get into the Ugga half of the world. And there's not actually a strong narrative for this first half of Ugga Booga. You kind of have to just sort of piece together what to do from context clues. Like there's this shrine with some dino feet indicators on it. And if you wander around, you eventually come across this dino egg you can hatch. And you're yep. like, maybe I should lead this dino over there. And like the dogfish before it, it viciously and graphically eats uh, the patrolling Uggas you lead it pa- by on your way back to this shrine. And if you operate the little switches, oh, you use the catapult here too, the slingshot. Uh, use the slingshot to hit the wall switches which raise up the dais and bring it crashing down to smash the baby dinosaur that's been calling you mama as you lead it around the level (laughs) so anybody who follows me on on DK Vine uh, follows the the conversation uh, reads any of my writings on, on the topics will know this is the most traumatic bit for me, in Conker's Bad Fur Day, and it is th- where I really part ways with the character of Conker for a long time because this this is this is too far for me. Yeah, that um, and I I get I I you're right. This is very much a piece of 2001, like the the humor, like the the kind mm. of callous, cynical, shock humor. <sighs> um, I think. I- I think even they knew because like in the guide, there's a bunch of like couching, like now, now, now dinosaur sacrifice is perfectly normal. And like, and I don't know. I just think Conker's acting out of character here, even for the rest of the game, him just being kind of gleeful about this is just sort of like, where the heck did that come from? Yeah. 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 And, and maybe he's, I, I don't know. Like it, 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 you're right, it is out of character, and I can try to rationalize it as much as I want, which I will do, but it it does feel, like, completely at odds with the guy who was uh, comforting the wounded Frankie earlier yeah. in the game. And I, I also get, like, there's a, almost a bit of gleeful, like... Um, destruction of Twelve Tales here. Where yeah. the 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 dinosaur sidekick, which is is basically taken from Barry's portions of Twelve Tales, mm-hmm. and and this is basically sacrificing that aspect, that character, uh, in service of this bit of bad fur day. Mm-hmm. So I I get like the meta element there, but they they could have gone about this in ways that aren't so upsetting where the the baby dinosaur is calling you mama and i think anybody who or yeah or even had like it play out the way it does except conquer's reaction is different instead of being gleeful about it he could have been like oh god no what the hell yes yeah. yeah like like you could have still had the shock horror of it happening but conquer not realizing it's going to happen and then just being like mortified i think that would have salvaged this <laughs> you know yeah. it's like but but as it is as it is in a game it's like conquer yeah. what the hell dude uh, fuck you uh, especially fuck since you. just like a few chapter segments later you're riding around on another dinosaur they could have easily had it be the same dinosaur and instead of getting smashed he gets dropped down a pit and conquer thinks he's dead only for him to return in the coliseum segment later or something like there there are a number of different ways they could have gone about this than how they did 
Uh, you just... could have ridden Bloopy, or this could have been Fangy. Yeah. Like, it, it's... You know, and, <laughs> and, and this, this is... What, like, this isn't problematic in the same way that the cogs are. This is problematic for me, the animal lover, and for, like, the the sentimental sap who doesn't like to see uh animals harmed in uh in movies and well, tv shows it's it's also problematic in that yeah it's just it's kind of out of character for conquer with how he's been yeah. portrayed in the game up to this point and how he's portrayed after this point in the game like it just kind of happens and i i don't know i suspect maybe you're right in a bit that it's a bit of of meta textual gleefully smashing the remains of twelve tails in service of bad fur day, mm-hmm. um, because Bloopy very much is uh, Barry's little purple dinosaur <laughs> companion um, yeah. from Twelve yeah. Tales. So yeah. yeah, and and so like whenever I hear people f- at Rare or or Chris Sieber explain like, well, Conquer, he's merely surrounded by all of these. Uh, ne'er do wells and just uh, like complete assholes. Conquer himself is not, and I'm like, but Bloopy, but Bloopy, like you, you, you could say that, and yes, like the rest of the game, that statement would be accurate. But he sacrifices this creature who thought him his mother. Yeah. <laughs> uh... So, and, and, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I like we'll, we'll move on because I know this episode is bordering on an obscene length. But <laughs> uh, I, 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 I rationalize it. This is like we're, this is where Conqueror and the the stress of his day and, you know, fighting a poo monster and still not being home. And I, I feel like this is where Conquer is starting to break a little bit. Yeah. As as a an individual uh his Mm. morality is starting to bend quite a bit and he's getting to the point where he's like the ends justify the means yeah and this is where like the karmic retribution the instant karma that will eventually uh hit him hard at the end of the game um yeah this is really where it it like starts to come into play like You're, maybe you yeah maybe you need bloopy and the sacrifice to show that conquer is becoming a bit of a monster and yeah that that's another spot know. in which this chapter starts shifting things because up to this point conquer's just kind of gone through things and helping people either altruistically or not altruistically and he's he's made out the better for it um, but this is the chapter in the game where it kind of starts blowing up in his face a little bit. Um, yeah. and yeah, so, so that, that blood sacrifice gets the giant like T-Rex head, uh, gate to open up after saying, I am pleased. And, um, <laughs> you, uh, need to, to solve its, uh, gunky throat issue. Uh, by doing some pepper in its nose. It's unclear whether this altar is alive or not because it's a giant head and you go through it and there's some some mucus-covered innards, but you come out the back and it's just like a stone passage. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and you swipe one of a the, the headdresses off of a sleeping Uga, so you're now wearing this saber wolf-looking wolf hat thing that the rest of the Ugas are wearing. Uh, which allows it gets them to acknowledge you as one of their own and you can herd them around like a bunch of cats and get them to follow you up and lead them in a charge against the rock guys who are guarding the entrance to the nightclub. And you finally get into the nightclub after proving that you're a bad enough dude by murdering all of the rock people who were in your way. And this is where Conker's finally reunited with Barry, sort of. He sees her in the, the go-go pit. I don't necessarily know if she sees him. But you have to uh, go around the nightclub area, um, getting drunk, peeing on uh, rock dudes who are just kind of trying to have a nice time, and rolling them onto switches to free Barry from her go-go cage. 
In some clubs, that would be a nice time. Yeah, I don't know. None of the clubs I've been to have gotten that wild. <laughs> Maybe not during a pandemic, but... Yeah. I have been peed on a couple times, but not at a club. Um, uh, yeah, like, you, you free Barry, you grab some more cash, uh, you get, make to leave... And you are stopped by the bouncer who says the boss wants to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And this is the introduction of Don Weezo. Yeah. Yeah. And Don Weezo is kind of like the the third antagonist of the game. Mm-hmm. And he uh yeah, he runs the Weasel Mafia and also is the uh I guess owner of the club. He He's he's got his fingers in the pie at least. He's he's has something to do with the operations here and the the Ugas encroaching on the rock people's half of the world is crimping into his operations. So he wants you to run a bomb through. He wants you to commit genocide. Yeah, basically. Um very passive aggressively uh, says she doesn't know you. She's kind of draping herself over Don Weezo in front of Conker. Conker's like, "Oh, hey, Barry," and Barry's like, "I don't know him. What are you talking about?" Mm-hmm. Um, which Conker's like, "Whatever about it. he doesn't seem particularly bothered by this." He doesn't uh, know. You <laughs> get the impression that this is not the first time this has happened. Um, <laughs> they're such a great couple. They're such a great couple. Um, you end up running the bomb through because Don Mito doesn't really give you much of an option. <laughs> um, cause he's, you know, the mafia, he's the, the godfather. Mm-hmm. Um, and you chuck it and it, uh, sets off the volcano that this has all been resting on, uh, which leads into, I know I complained about Bat's tower a lot, but fuck this next bit. So hard. You don't like the lava boarding? No, I don't like the lava boarding. It took me four hours. I liked it. I liked it all right. Okay. <laughs> well, we all know Hyle's inclinations now. Look, I, I, I like that there's... I mean, why is there a hoverboard sequence in the prehistoric area? I don't know. I don't know. know but The music is a banger. If the music weren't so goddamn yes. good, I think I would have been way more frustrated <laughs> with this bit. Um... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you, the lava rises, Conker has to do a bit of an escape. He is promptly mugged by some Ugga hooligans who steal all of the money you've accumulated up to this point. And you have to... Considering their entire people and civilization was just wiped out. I can't blame them. Yeah. Um, they don't seem terribly bothered by it, though. No, Uh, because everyone in this game is an amoral asshole, except for maybe Rodent. Yeah, Rodent's really the standout here. Um, yeah, you have to to race them in quotes to get your money back, and it's really uh, kind of whacking them with a frying pan during a chase sequence. You're you're doing you know Diddy Kong racing laps basically, um, and avoiding the fucking dinosaurs that get in your way. I swear, if those dinosaurs were removed, this this segment wouldn't be half as annoying. Um, but you get them all back and, uh, the, the course shifts around as you progress further into, to beating these hooligans up and getting your money back and you get spit out in the Coliseum, which is lifted directly mm-hmm. from the Coliseum, uh, in 12 tales, uh, where you would have fought the Cyclops, except now instead of Cyclops, he's got two eyes, and it's no longer Roman themed. It's been re reskinned to fit the prehistoric theme of the rest of the chapter. Yes, he's basically the the big caveman boss. Um... Yeah, you you do a bit of a Colosseum fight. Um, in Twelve Tales, this would have been against um, uh, skeletons, sort of Jason and the Argonauts style. We we've seen footage of that sort of this exact sequence playing out, but with differently themed enemies. <laughs> Um, you're, you're fighting Ugas for the entertainment of the crowd as directed by, uh, Bugga the Nut as he's trying to impress Jugga with Coliseum antics. I am trying to say these names with a straight face. 
<laughs> um, you you fight successive waves. Eventually, uh, Buga gets tired of you uh, being successful in your endeavors and brings out um, uh, Fangy. Uh, mm. a, a raptor that I can't help but think is modeled after the live action Yoshi from the Super Mario Bros. movie. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, you hypnotize him with your stopwatch, which, by the way, now reads at about 5 past 3 p.m. Uh, so the day has progressed a little bit um, for those keeping track. And you can ride him and... Uh, either uh, bop uh, Oga foot soldiers over the edge into the lava below or let Fangy eat them. Graphically. Graphically. Uh, eventually, uh, Jugga will start playfully calling uh, Oga's manhood into question, or Bugga's manhood into question, and he'll hop down to deal with you himself. Uh, and the ensuing boss fight sees you... Um, uh, biting on said manhood and biting on his bottom and tearing chunks out of it again graphically eventually uh, defeating him by revealing to his shame and horror that uh, he is is his nether bits are not proportional to the size of his massive body no no uh, not well endowed despite his proclamation that he has the biggest bone yep uh, yep so Juga doesn't uh, actually seem that surprised by this. Uh, she just finds it amusing. Yes. Um, yes. Um, basically, yeah, I, I think it plays more like, oh, Bug of the Nuts, toxic masculinity is making us a bigger problem than than it actually is. But yeah. uh, so, so it is, and he's got a bleeding ass now. So Yeah, again, uh, like, mechanically, this is a solid boss fight. Uh, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit graphic, but it's a fun raptor riding boss fight against a big giant um i i would have to say you know out of the entire n64 library this is the best bloody asshole uh <laughs> out of any of them mm. the bloody assholes in super mario 64 do not compare yeah and they're not they, as well that, graphically that rendered just, either yeah that was more of a really just a technical demo of bleeding mm -hmm. assholes glorified tech demo to, really yeah, um, yeah. Th compared to where we are, uh, where we got with Bad Fur Day, so yeah, bravo, mm -hmm. bravo. Um, you you do a little scene where uh, Conquer is just overwhelmed with amorous um, feelings towards Jugga's Jugga's, uh, and she's just sort of it's like, no, silly, this this would never work out. You you be on your way now. Yeah, you're you're a little squirrel. I'm a giant cave woman. Yeah, um, but you know, we, I can't help like, think this scene is a parody of something, but I can't for the life of me put my finger on what it is. You know, Conker's uh, sexual appetites aren't. The more we learn about him, uh, including in Big Reunion, I think that Conker is, like, pansexual. He's definitely, like, he's got... Um, yeah, he does wake up in the beginning of Big Reunion naked with some of the local little squirrel things falling out of him. So... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think Conker, like... He he is definitely attracted... He's uh, frying like, pansexual. Squ squirrels, chipmunks... Uh, squirrels from project spark cave women doesn't matter it's all good to him yep. um yeah yeah um i got a plush of one of those squirrels by the way i did not know they put out like actual project spark merch i have a couple pins i have a plush of one of those squirrels i have a t-shirt on the way i need to get one of those plushes so i can uh pair it with my fan gamer conquer plush Ooh. the chris siever voice chip yeah well go go look on ebay um yeah that's that's pretty much the end of the chapter she she puts you up there it's the exit to the area you follow a wad of cash out it mm. uh spits you out back at the the back entrance of Sloprano, which you can go you can either go back through Sloprano to exit out Pooh Mountain, or you can kind of hop off down 
below and you'll take some like a hefty chunk of fall damage but you'll be back in windy and uh, at this point if you have collected all of the money up to this point you are what is it 600 shy of the total you can get in the game so you'd have uh i think you end up with 2310 total not including the million. Not including the million. So minus 600, if I can do basic math, uh, you should have like 27, or no, you should have 1710 at this point if you've collected everything. Um, because there's another 500 to get in Windy at this point in the game as we uh, wrap up the final bits before Nights Falls. Um, because as you make your way back into Windy, you're treated to a little cutscene of the hive getting stolen again. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is where I, I like mix up the chronology because I forget that this was a sequence that came, you came back around to. Yeah. Um, um, you come across the queen who's bawling her eyes out and expects you to help out again and conquer being a bit more cynical than he was this morning is like, well, what's in it for me? And he kind of haggles for a reward and gets her up yeah, to... Yeah, Conker's to... like, whoa, 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 I'm a full-blown dinosaur murderer now. Yeah. And I just committed caveman genocide. What's in it for me? Kind of kind of gets her up to $400 uh, dollars and agrees to go get the hive back again. You have to actually venture into the wasp nest this time, and you get to use the turret uh, encampment in the hive. And this introduces you to the first of the game's gun shooting sections, which kind of... Oh, but not the last. No, oh, just no. This setting is, the stage for what's to yeah, come. Yeah, pretty much. And you you basically kill this entire hive, except for those three jerks. Um, and make your way out. May uh, You can make a brief detour to pick up a bundle of cash uh, that is in the side of the hive before you or in the side of the wasp nest before you grab the beehive. And basically just repeat what you did earlier. You run down the path while they stab at you from behind. Same music, whatever. Uh, once you get it back, the queen jumps in. And in addition to the machine guns this time, there's also rocket launchers. And, you know, they get mowed down again. They'll probably <laughs> be back. Um, uh... And she reluctantly forks over the $400, uh, which should bring you up to, I believe, 2210 at this point. And you yeah. need 2110 to progress past the last money gate. So you can have missed one bundle of cash up to this point in the game. Um, and you finally, at this point, climb up the hill that the windmill is sitting atop. Mm -hmm. so yeah you climb up it you talk to this guy in a barrel uh, while avoiding some some earthworms with vicious fangs who will chew the shit out of conquer on the way oh, up. right the the uh the tremor style like uh earthworms that pop up and and mr barrel is at the top and he wants uh 21k to be able to take you for a ride um i I'm trying to imagine what the the tower portion would be if it was here at the windmill. Like, imagine, like, Mr. Barrel wants you to go inside and you do the thing with the cogs and climbing up the, the tower to f hit the switch at the top here because with its windmill internals and then you come out and Mr. Barrel is ready for you to go on a ride or something. Mm -hmm. rather than over in bat's tower where it was disconnected from the chapter <laughs> um yeah i don't know either way you fork over the money conquer is kind of confused gets up on mr barrel you ride him down killing all the earthworms you just avoided along the way uh conquer loses his balance mr barrel goes careening off breaking through a barrier that was uh, blocking some of the river flow earlier and conquer passes out and night falls yes so we did get an anthropomorphic barrel in conquer we did uh, you're right 
Another Donkey yeah, Kong so, universe tradition. Well, is is Mr. Barrel the... F- I guess Belcha would be the first anthropomorphic barrel, unless well, you're including, like, Dum Drum. I don't know. Like, is he an anthropomorphic barrel, or is he guy in a barrel? Because, like, the eyes are peeking out from under the lid of the barrel. It's unknown. It's ambiguous uh, what Mr. Barrel is. If he's a barrel... Or if he's uh, something in the barrel, but That's uh, fair, either I way, guess. either way, I love and, and barrels came back in big reunion. Not Mister Barrel, but yeah. uh, there's a whole sequence with barrels that actually directly references Donkey Kong. So. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, and of course, in the next episode, we'll talk about the TNT barrels uh, that that come into play. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, that wraps up the daytime chapters. Yeah, this this is actually the only like time uh, in the game where we have like a jump where like Conquer passes out mm-hmm. and thing things aren't continuous. So we've got like a a, a leap ahead as far as yes. uh, time goes. So we get later at night, and yeah, Mister Barrel has inadvertently. In, in true Donkey Kong Country styles, opened up a secret passage, but not to a bonus area, but <laughs> to hell on earth, essentially. Uh, Conquer's ancestral home, as it turns out. Uh, yes. Uh, so we got a call to take, and ooh, then we ooh, will wrap it up. Yes, let's... A call on the topic, uh, and then we'll discuss our final thoughts on daylight. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? I watched the newest Kongversation video about Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Um, my name is Jake. I don't know. If, whatever. <laughs> um, I, I just want to talk about Conquer's Bad Fur Day and how it's like one of those games that really like it just goes out there and beyond everything like <laughs> as a game. Um, I remember when I was 12 back in, like, 2013, I, I was born in 2001, um, I discovered a playthrough of it by PewDiePie, and I watched, like, one episode of it, and immediately the game clicked with me. I liked games like Mario 64, Mario Sunshine. Um, I had just gotten a copy of Banjo-Kazooie for the Xbox Live Arcade around that time, and I absolutely loved that game. And, you know, Conquer <laughs> was um, more or less, it was kind of like an enigma. Because a lot of my friends didn't know about it. Um, and not to mention, you know, it's, it, it, it's an old game. But, um... It's kind of like the um, the hidden gem of the Nintendo 64. I'm sorry if I'm pausing a lot. I just I don't know how to describe that game, but I just think more people need to play it, experience it for what it is, rolling those balls of poo and you know witnessing uh, bug of the nut. <laughs> it, it, it's fun watching the podcast. I greatly enjoy you guys talking and everything have a good day well thank you for the call jake you got it in like one second before the cutoff (laughs) that that's impressive work there nice uh but yeah so he mentions like conquers bad fur day the hidden gem of the n64 and that 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 i that's i guess a good way to describe it because it's a game that underperformed significantly when it came out yeah and grew in legend and stature uh to the point where i think it's considered like a one of the classics of the n64 library yeah it's frequently on top 10 lists even if in a a contemporary sense it really wasn't i mean a lot of people moved on from the n64 by that point but uh you know the gamecube came out later that year but it um, is the donkey kong country 3 of rare's n64 output Essentially, yeah, but you know, when you have enough years, um, adding stacking on top of that, uh, 
historical trivia like that doesn't matter as much and people <laughs> just view it as a product of that era yeah even you know it, it really does feel like a different era though i mean it came out in 2001 march 2001 which was already very culturally different from 1996 uh yeah. the beginning of the N64. like five years had passed and a lot can change in five years so yeah look at Look at uh, Diddy Kong Racing near the beginning of the N64's lifespan and Conquer in that versus Conquer in Conquer's Bad Fur Day at the end of <laughs> sure. the N64 lifespan. Sure. I mean, yeah, if you want to get literal and specific like that, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, it's it's been fun for me as uh, someone who's been, you know, the co-founder of DK Vine and essentially... Uh, one of the editor in chiefs or the editor in chief, uh, for most of the tenure, uh, since Conquer came out to now, 20 years, uh, it's been, I think, a, a joy to see Conquer being mostly, uh, ignored and underperforming to it rising in the ranks and in people's esteem since then. And, um, I mean, that's really been the case of really, like, all of this shit we talk about here on DK Vine. Because even, like, <laughs> the early days of DK Vine really butted up against that whole, like, actually, the Donkey Kong Country trilogy is overrated kind of hot take uh, period where we just denigrate, like, all of Rare's output um, on the on the the Nintendo consoles and then... Then we eventually come back around and was like, no, wait, those games were really good. And, and here's uh, the th our third take on them. <laughs> and, and now now we're in that comfortable place where uh, they're all considered classics and we, we can just uh, leave that be. You know, we, we, we've gone through the whole we're going to tear down the idols of the previous decade mm. and, and now we're going to build them back up out of, you know, in this nostalgic shrine and every, everything's fine now. We didn't need to sacrifice any dinosaurs to that shrine. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, and it's been, it's been even weird to see like, like again, I bring up you Gibbon, uh, you, the, the, the Mario versus Donkey Kong <laughs> uh, poster on the DK vine form to see you become a conquer uh, a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That is a thing that happened. <laughs> and after Bats replaying Bats Tower for this episode, you're questioning that. Oh uh, uh, no! As I as I said on Discord, like I there were some parts of the game that frustrated me a lot, um, but they're vastly outnumbered by the parts of the game that are good and even great. And I think overall, it's uh, a rather good experience, and I don't don't regret being a fan of it at all. So yeah. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the call, Jake, and I want to give a special thanks to everyone who's joined us in the live stream. Uh, you can listen to every episode of The Conversation uh, live as we record them. Uh, if, if you are a DK Vine patron at the $5 and up tier, and you can find that at dkvine.com forward slash Patreon. Special thanks to Ray Day Pinball, Brittle Nipples Kevin... Uh, as well as our own Cameron Regal. Hello, Cameron. Uh, Kevin, just wondering if we're going to hit the four hours mark. If I wrap this up quickly, we will not. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm checking my stopwatch just like Conker checks his. But uh, you can also call in if you have more to say or if you have something to say about Conker's Bad Fur Day. We do have one more episode in the Spotlight series. Mm -hmm. So feel free to call the DK Vine hotline whenever you want. Until then, it's 1-202-630-VINE. That's 1-202-630-VINE or 8463. That's what the uh, those letters correspond to on a touch tone phone or whatever you call the, the, the keypad, the, the <laughs> number pad on your your mobile devices. But uh, yeah, let us know uh, your thoughts on Conquer's Bad Fur Day. And that wraps up the daytime portion, Gibbon. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly so does. Conquer, Conquer's taking a rest on the ground. Now we can take a rest on the ground and, and rest up to talk about 
vampires and and zombies and and fascist (laughs) teddy bears and Uh, basically we're just reliving 2020 all over again yeah oh god but we will also be talking about the game's many and varied multiplayer modes so yes right yes something that we would not be able to experience in 2020 because (laughs) we have to we we can't visit each other's houses but fortunately um, the game has bot support which again really amazing for an n64 title something it doesn't get enough credit for but yeah uh see i was just gonna go into another like 20 minute detour talking about the beach uh multiplayer thing and how much i enjoy playing that by myself as a kid but then we would hit the four hour mark and then um, kevin would be proven right so i have to end it here this has been a file two production perico